Jay. How we doing? Want to, uh, want to take care of. So if you cannot, um, if you cannot attend, uh, the proxy is Got some old peeps on the radio. And, uh, I'm going to just go back to my little stinger video because I'm really proud of that. Let's switch back and then come back to this. Look at this. There we go. How's that level? Better? All right. We're going to fix this uh, partially uh, with some gear that we're going to fuck with tonight. Um, I got some neat Craigslist grabs. So uh, audio is about to get even better on the stream. <clears throat> Sorry. But before we do that, I'm going to go back to my Stinger video. Look at this shit. How good is that? I'm so proud of it. So yes, the ceremonial cracking of the tall boy. Butcher gets credits for that logo. He he did the original design. I polished it up. I uh, I got a trial of uh, what is it After Effects, and uh, kind of turned it from a from a sketch into a real boy. We got hiss. Bag it off. Oh, hiss on the beer. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah, we got some logos. I got After Effects. I'm still in the demo. I guess I'm actually going to pay for Creative Cloud. Oh, wait. Hang on. My toys. There we go. Now you can actually see my ass. <clears throat> I forget that I have, like, actual lighting going on here. But uh, I guess I'm going to pay for Adobe Creative Suite. I'm going to try to get a deal from them. And uh, see if they'll basically uh, allow me to use the educational clause to get it for 29 a month so I can uh, do more graphics and play with videos and stuff like that. So I guess without further ado, let's go ahead and get involved with the topics of the evening. Um, <clears throat> pop that down a little bit. Let me tweak my light. Hang on. There we go. A little bit better. Um, so, uh, I bought stuff this week. I bought a whole bunch of shit. Um, it's all related to the stream or my radio hobby. Um, mostly stream stuff. So we're going to go over, check out some of the toys I got, and then, uh, dig into one of the broken ones. Broken. Um... We'll kind of get into uh, a little bit of repair and troubleshooting and uh, see what we can do to uh, bring a uh, vastly underpriced piece of gear back to life. Um, so uh, let's see what we got here. I need desk space because none of this shit is small. Uh, let me tweak my cam. Um, we'll get to it. Patience, patience. We got three hours to rock it. I won't drag it out quite that long for the story, but, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll get to it here. So, oh, I literally have a pile of shit stacked up next to me so we can play show and tell. So the first thing we got is, um, I really like this little Behringer 802. It's got USB outputs and stuff like that. But the thing is, is that, um, here in the studio, I have, uh, that mixer, which is what's actually feeding the stream. Um, it's actually chained off of this mixer, which is an MX882. It's just a six-line mixer. Um, it's an okay setup. I've been using the 882 for a while just to feed my radios. Um, so it just handles uh, audio in and out from my rigs. Um, and I was like, well, I can just send the feed from that into the stream mixer, and we can be good to go. Um, I found that it's kind of clumsy to think, okay, bring this level up pan this down, all that stuff. So I went on eBay, did uh, <clears throat> three or four days of stalking various auctions, and I got um, what I consider to be one of the most underrated deals of uh, cheap mixers of the past 10 or 15 years. Uh, so the backstory on this is that um, good old Behringer, we're gonna be talking a lot about everybody's favorite cheap equipment uh, uh, brand here, uh, came out with a line of mixers um, that were uh, basically 
uh, copyright infringements, patent infringements on the Mackie 1604 VLZ series. Uh, the VLZ channel strip, um, meaning that the line of circuitry in one single channel um, is pretty famous for being able to be driven hard without distortion. It has a great EQ, um, just a really, really good mixer. And Behringer, back before they tried to, de tried to become a little bit more respectable, they were all about just blatantly copying people. Um, and that's what they did with this. So I've actually owned one of these years ago, but our first purchase was a Behringer MX2642 board. Um, so this was uh, one of the mixers that Behringer got sued by Mackie over. Um, so, uh, you know, it's pretty obvious that Mackie saw this as a threat. Um, I bought one of these new about 12 years ago. Uh, I loved it to death. And I was a dumbass teenager, um, well, not quite teenager, d dumbass 23 year old. And when I moved from one uh, shitty party house um, to another, um, I just basically gave it away to somebody because I was like, I don't have room in my new place, yada, yada, so on. Um, and I've missed the thing um, because it's really flexible. We'll get into a couple of the reasons why it's so good um, beyond the obvious uh, patent uh, thievery type stuff that makes it sound good. Um, but I've, I've been looking for one of these for, the, we'll say weeks at least, ever since I knew that the stream was going to become like an actual real thing. I've wanted to have just one board for all my mixing and like all my routing here on the whole desk. Um, so I don't have to worry about this mixer and that mixer and so on. So this is going to be the new like audio brain of the Maddie Zedcast, um, as well as just my general radio games, um, and stuff like that. So why did I pick this? Um, beyond the fact that I've owned one, I know it's good. Um, I've owned other mixers since then, and I came back to this thing. Uh, one of the big things is that um, this is what's called a four bus mixer. Um, the model 2642 reflects that. Um, it has uh, 26 input channels, um, four uh, subgroups, we call them, and then two main outputs, stereo outs. Um, w w what does that mean? Okay, so um, mixers sometimes have extra buses, and that's what these one, two, and three, and four buttons here. I'll do a little zoom in on the strip here. Um, so all the channels have three buttons here: uh, one, two, three, four, and main. Now Canadian. Oh, yeah, with the Z. Okay, it freaked me out for a second. I was like, shit, did I pull my Uper back? Um, so we got three buses that we can route each individual channel to. So this is an on off switch to send it to the one and two subgroup. This is for the three and four. And then this is for the main outputs. So over here, you'll see the output section and you can see the subgroups here. So you can, you know, take a channel and then pop it on, you know, only channel one and two here. So this would not be routed to the main output as it's currently set up. But what it would do is go to these subgroups, and these are like um, accessible via jacks on the back. Um, and what you can do is if you want to send something, say, to a computer, but not output it through the speakers, for example, um, you can have your computer sound card input feeding off of the one and two bus here. And that way, anything that you want to send just to the computer, you lift all three buttons and then hit the one, two. You don't hear it through the main outputs but you will get it fed to the PC sound card. So obviously this is pretty powerful for like, you know, say I have some microphones, I've got some radios coming in and so on, and I wanna send one to another, um, I can just individually route those. So that's why I picked a four bus mixer. Um, my thinking is to have, you know, obviously a PC sound card off one subgroup, um, the others, not sure what I'm gonna do with it, but it's good to have expansion capability. Um, another thing about this uh, mixer that's cool, um, I've got some nice just stereo line-ins here. Um, they don't have EQ or anything, but it's good for just pumping, you know, say if I got a, you know, like a music player or something, I can just put it on here, it's nice and simple. Um, it also has the subgroup routing for those channels. Um, so if I wanna, you know, feed one to the three and four or the main or whatever. Um, Another neat thing about this is that it has a lot of aux buses. So if you haven't played with a mixer before, 
there's a concept of aux sends. Um, what these do is um, there's several outputs on the back. It's sort of like subgroups, except each channel has an individual fader to mix. Um, so what I'm thinking is that I'm going to have different radios. Um, they're uh, audio inputs um, off of different aux buses here. So say I have a microphone here on channel one and I want to send it to my third radio. I can just turn that fader up and that's going to get sent to the third radio. Um, so this has a total of six buses. I can hit four, four out of the six at any time. So if this button's up, these two knobs control buses uh, uh, three and four. If it's down, it'll send them to five and six. Kind of a weird setup. It just saved them two knobs on each one. Um, but really having six aux buses all the time is a little bit overkill. So this gives me four out of six at any given time. Um, so, uh, you know, it's great. There's solo buttons. So if I want to set levels on stuff, um, it's called PFL, prefade listen. So I punch that and this basically gets set automatically to zero dB on the fader, no matter where it's at and then cuts all the other channels. So we'll, so what you do is you take all your channels one at a time, you, you, you put them in pre-fade listen, and then you can use your VU meter here to make sure that the levels are where you want. And you take off PFL and everything is back to being controlled by the faders. And you can mix stuff effectively without having, uh, you know, like clipping problems or low levels, stuff like that. Um, so that's, that's basically the long and short of why I love this mixer so much. Um, this thing has virtually no wear and tear. All the knobs are intact. All the knobs I've like cycled every one. Not one of them is noisy. Every channel works. Um, the only wear on this is like, there's a little bit of rash on the rack screws. So this was definitely somebody's like studio queen. They bought a shitload of gear 10 years ago put this in a rack and then never touched it. Um, nor normally the paint kind of fades on the mute buttons and the PFLs, none of that here. So this thing was in really good shape. Um, I did that dumb like best offer crap on eBay um, and I uh, got it for like 15% off asking and it happened to ship out of Colorado Springs. Um, so it got here three days early, very cool. Um, so yeah, I paid a hundred bucks for it. Well worth every penny. Um, and uh, you can see, uh, flip it over here, it's pretty heavy. So as it's set up, you know, you're like, I want a rack mixer, I want to mount it vertically in a rack. So it has all the stuff on the back. Those are all the inputs, the inserts and stuff like that. But what's cool about this is they ripped off Mackie yet again. Mackie has a feature called the Rotopod, um, which means that you can have the, the outputs either on the back of the mixer or on the front or on the, on, um, on the back. We'll call this the back um, if it's on a desktop. So if I want, which I'm probably going to do depending on where the thing gets installed, I may install a rack, I may run it on the desk, but I can unscrew these panels and unscrew this panel and then I can put all the jacks on the, on the quote unquote back of the mixer here and then put this panel where this is and boom, everything's rotated and accessible. So it's really configurable. You can set it up exactly how your studio is. Um, and yeah, I'm super happy. Um, so that's gonna be the new mixer. We'll have it live on Saturday. Um, down you go. Um, so then you might say, well, how are you gonna hook it up with all those wires and stuff like that? You know, you need cabling and stuff like that. So I thought ahead, went to our good friends, amazon.com. We've got all kinds of connectivity here. I've got XLRs, I've got mono quarters, uh, we got RCA cables. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I just, I bought fistfuls of everything. So uh, lots of cable soldering coming up. Um, I'm excited though, because um, it's that's always a fun time. Um, I've made many XLRs and quarter inch cables in the past. Um, making XLRs is very, uh, very calming to me, because it's nice, you have to, pay attention to the three wires and make sure everything's clean and just nice soldering work. You know, it's very chill. Um, you're just doing like slow speed assembly line type stuff. So I'm excited to make all the cables up for this. Um, one thing that I used to have set up that I'm probably gonna bring back um, is I have this funky old school sound card. Uh, it's called the M-Audio Delta 410. Now you might've heard of M-Audio. They've 
been in kind of the prosumer market for a while. Um, <clears throat> sorry. And this is a really interesting card. It's a PCI card, has a DB25 on the back, and then it has a breakout harness. And it has um, eight analog outputs and two analog inputs. Um, back in the day, uh, like home theater nerds actually loved these things because they could do 7.1 outputs with discrete outs for everything. So you take that, feed it into your big ass Yamaha or Ankia or whatever, and you'd have full 7.1 surround. Um, I'm not gonna be, be doing it for that, but I am gonna set it up with this. And that's why I got all those RCAs. Um, I got 12 foot RCA cable, or sorry, 20 foot RCA cables, bought a half dozen of them. Um, and then we're gonna chop those in half and we're gonna put um, quarter inch plugs on the, the chopped ends. So we're gonna make like eight or 10 stereo pairs, run that into my M Audio uh, card, which amazingly enough, even though I bought the thing in fucking 2003, if I recall, um, I have confirmed that it still loads up the Windows XP drivers perfectly in Windows 10 and works 100%. Um, that's one thing that Windows, man, they're good about. Gear, as long as you have XP drivers, um, it'll work through any OS up to and including uh, Windows 10. Um, so that's one really cool thing. I've tried it in like, you know, de desktop Macs and stuff. Absolutely not. Used to work. St they stopped putting out drivers in like 2008 or so, something like that. Um, but the Windows 10 will load up the XP drivers, no problem. And um, the way it presents it in Windows is super awesome. You then have four stereo pairs that you can route things to. So you can have, uh, you know, like uh, your Spotify coming out on uh, stereo one, two. You could have uh, Discord on stereo three, four. Uh, your uh, Fortnite or whatever on stereo 5, 6, and then whatever the hell else you want on 7 and 8. And you can then hardware mix those, um, which is really super freaking sweet. And that's how I used to play uh, um, my stupid MMORPGs. Uh, played uh, Dark Age of Camelot for years. So I'd have the game audio on one pair, have our uh, uh, chat, which we were still using TeamSpeak then, on another pair. And then I'd have my like Winamp or whatever on a third pair. So if somebody started talking, I could fade down the music or I could turn up the game. And it was all hardware controls there right at my fingertips. Didn't have to click through to any windows or bullshit like that. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm uh, super excited about the mixer. Um, that's gonna be the new brains of the operation. Um, pause for a beer. Sorry, I had literally five hours of meetings today at work. Um, use Fastly, um, lots of uh, training classes and I had to interview somebody and stuff like that. So I'm already talked out um, and we got a couple hours to go and I'm never playing MMOs again. Thank you, Megishu, but offer declined. I learned my lesson. That shit took four years of my life. Um, so we got a mixer, we got routing and we got levels. So, uh, <clears throat> Actually, we'll save that for number three, the next part, and we'll go into the middle. Um, this is the hottest deal. This is all, um, an, an infinite discount. So I was on Craigslist. I uh, have search engine or uh, search query set up on uh, all the local Craigslist for various terms, and um, I check them probably once an hour while I'm awake. Um, it's just a little habit I do. Uh, and this is an example of why. Um, this was up for one hour before I sniped it, and I was actually number two in line, and the guy said, eh, somebody else already claimed it. Um, I'll let you know if it's, you know, like there again. Who is texting? Oh, another follower that can't make it says he hopes the stream's going well. Um, so I sniped this um, because the other guy that uh, claimed it couldn't show up until Friday, so the seller, seller said, uh, if you want this, show up at 2 p.m. at this uh, Starbucks across town. So I uh, went across town and I picked up, this is really exciting. This needs repair, um, but this is a Yezu FT757GX uh, HF or shortwave radio. Um, it's a 100 watt radio. Um, market value and fully working shape is between 350 and 400 bucks. Um, the knob feel is A plus, absolutely stellar. 
um, has an analog meter, vacuum fluorescent display, um, all the switches work and all that. The problem with this radio as described is that it has no power output on transmit. You can receive signals all day long, um, but it doesn't talk. Um, and the uh, uh, guy that previously had it um, said that he messed with it. He got it working a little bit um, just the other day. Um, it worked for five minutes and had full power output. Um, and then it stopped working again. And he got mad at it and said, to hell with this thing, I'm giving it to somebody else. It's gonna become somebody else's problem. That somebody is now me. Um, he gave me the uh, parts of the service manual. Um, and uh, um, I've already done quick tests on it. Um, it looks like it actually has about one watt of power output. Um, and due to the way these radios are built, it indicates that a couple of certain transistors are smoked in there. Um, so we're going to go in, we're going to do troubleshooting. This is going to be basically the spring uh, 2019 Matty Z project. This is not going to be a one session type thing. Um, and as a matter of fact, I'm thinking because this is going to be uh, kind of an intricate complex fix, we're going to have to rip this some bitch apart and pull out all the boards and have it basically open heart surgery on the bench with the scope and the signal generator and all that set up. Um, I may buy another desk from Ikea and set it up back here and add lights and a couple of more cameras. Um, so we'll have an operating room table in the back and we'll just leave this thing out, work on it on the stream till it's fixed. Um, and then because I have piles and piles of, of uh, HF radios already, um, my thinking is that we're going to try to flip this. We're gonna to try to sell it on eBay. Um, and then we're gonna turn that money into stream money. Um, and um, depending on how much I get for it, we're going to buy a bunch more uh, solder up kits and things to play with on the stream. And then we'll be doing giveaways um, so you can have an official Matty Z blinky LED thing um, or a little 10 watt audio amp and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, I like I just want to take this um, goal one is to resurrect it because I hate seeing a sad dead radio. And this thing is so close to being uh, fixed up and good. There's not that much wrong with it. Um, so I really want to get this thing back to life. Um, I thought about doing a giveaway for the radio for a follower, but the thing is that uh, you got to have a ham license to operate this. So I would have to make it a condition that somebody gets their ham license to receive this as a prize. And that gets into kind of gray area territory, for, you know, as far as Twitch rules for giveaways and stuff like that. Um, so my thinking is that we're going to take this, we're going to flip it on eBay or at a ham fest or something like that and take whatever money we make off that, turn it into more fun stuff in kind of smaller chunks for the stream. So that way 10 people can have a great time with a toy that we build on camera and then mail to them because they won the contest. Um, so that's going to be kind of what's going on. Flip it around, look at the back. Um, wish I had like, hang on, but I do have a flashlight. Um, so we can kind of light up the backside here. We can zoom in. You can see there's a lot of connectivity on these radios. Um, you got a ground lug. You got various little adjusty pots for tweaking various settings um, that you may need to infrequently access. Like you need to set your AM carrier level and stuff like that, but not all the time. That stuff goes on the back panel. Um, bunch of breakouts here for audio out, audio in. This big quarter inch here is where you hook up your Morse code key. Um, you know, very, very uh, able to be hooked up to the rest of your shack type radio. Um, it even has like some groovy, like this was like a common practice around the time this radio was built. By the way, this is a vintage 1983 um, to give you an idea of what a uh, 36 year old ham radio looks like. Um, and uh, no, the yellow RCA actually is supposed to be yellow. Um, there's no discoloration. Fortunately, this doesn't appear to have ever been smoker owned because um, that murders ham rigs. You can't ever get them clean. Um, but on the top, you have some more of those settings that are kind of uh, infrequently accessed, but you may want to mess with them. This stuff specifically controls um, the speed of some Morse code functions inside the radio. Um, you can tell there's like a missing screw here and there. Um, but I've already found out that several people have parted out dead versions of these radios. 
Um, and uh, so I can get parts, I can get screws, I can get a new final amp board, I can get this and that and the other um, for pretty cheap because um, they sell the parts for like five, 10, 15 bucks on eBay. So we're going to stage one, diagnose what the hell is wrong. We're going to see what we need to, to do to buy this, uh, to, to buy to get this fixed up. Um, and then we're going to fix it up. We're going to turn that into fine American dollars. And then we're going to turn that back into stream fun. Um, so the display fully works. All the switches fully work on it. Um, like I said, the tuning knob just feels wonderful. I wish I could, I could, uh, adequately explain how how fun it is to just spin the dial on this thing um super super rad and yes that is an iambic keyer um so uh, iambic keyers are things that work with the little code paddles here um it if you recall from a previous stream um if you hit one side of that it makes dot 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 and the other side makes dash 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 and the reason it's called an iambic keyer is if you squeeze both of them at the same time, um, they will do dot dash, dot dash, dot dash, dot dash. Um, hence the iambic terminology. Um, so yeah, this thing is dope. Um, you've got a carry handle on the side, so you can tote this around, go to the field day and all that. Um, it's reasonably heavy. That's a solid aluminum heat sink there. Um, no cooling fan, it's passively cooled, um, which is, uh, some of the radios of this vintage were passively cooled. Some of them ha have a fan, like my little 735 over here. That does have a fan, but it never kicks in. Because again, it has a huge ass heat sink, um, lots of dissipation. You can basically turn these things on, shit out 100 watts of power, 120 watts of power, max power, and they will run indefinitely without overheating or frying out. Um, that's in contrast to a lot of modern radios that don't put nearly enough just heavy metal heat sinking in the radios. Um, so they always have a fan, which is noisy because they spin up and, you know, kind of kill your vibe. Um, you may hear periodically a, a fan spit spinning up here on my, on my stream. I have a power supply down here with a temperature controlled fan. So it cycles up and down and turns on and off. Sometimes you can hear it, but it's really distracting when it turns on. Um, so having a hundred percent silent radio is really nice. You're not bothering anybody and it runs forever and it's super, super just reliable. Um, these things are tanks. Um, I'm not sure how this thing died. Um, 83 was a period where a lot of the, um, radio manufacturers started to go to robotic assembly of their radios. Um, actually the 735 was the first robotically assembled rig uh, on the market. Um, all the others were hand soldered. They paid people to put the parts in and test and so on. Um, so what's interesting about that, that wave of radios say 1980 through 84, 85 or so is that they were kind of hammering out the whole robotic assembly process. Um, and so as a result, you will find that some of the rigs have, um, kind of assembly flaws, not design flaws, more of assembly flaws. Um, where the robot didn't solder a joint quite well enough or it glopped a little bit too much solder on a particular joint. Um, for example, the 735s, um, they are notorious for having, um, they uh, go dead supposedly because there's a little tiny wire between the output antenna jack in the back and the circuit board that feeds it. Over time, that just kind of vibrates and, and breaks. Um, and people will say, my 735 is dead. It doesn't receive, it doesn't transmit, no power output. You go in, you crack the case, you resolder that wire, and in 30 seconds, you have a functioning radio again. But the interesting thing is that almost every ICOM 735 will exhibit that problem at least once throughout its history. So what you're looking at with those kind of early 80s radios is that they have um, common but well-documented and easily fixable flaws. Um, so that's why I really like that era of radios. It's when they started to put computer control in. So you can hook n not only that Yezu, but this ICOM up to a computer. They talk five volt serial through a standard open protocol and you can tune them, switch modes and switch them into transmit and receive and all that from a PC. And that was really groundbreaking back in the day. Um, nowadays, everything of course just has a USB jack on the back. Um, 
But the trick is, is that a lot of the USB controlled radios, they just have a USB to serial adapter in there. And they're using that same protocol that they've used for like 35 or 40 years for the actual internal communication. So everything still talks the same way. We've just moved the serial port 100% inside the radio. Um, so just neat quirks of that era. Um, I love the radios. I'm super glad that I got that. Again, that radio was free. I just happened to snipe it. Um, so yeah, it's a, you know, m like an infinite percent discount on that. Um, so yeah, I'm excited about both the mixer and that rig and about the next thing that we're going to drag up here on the table. So this is yet another thing that I found off Craigslist off of one of my periodic searches. And we'll bring it up on the bench here and set our camera a little bit. Um, so this is going to be our victim of the evening. Um, yeah, this is, it's hefty, it's hefty. Um, so this is a Behringer T1952 compressor. Uh, Behringer made these, oh, about for a couple year period, uh, back around 2010 or so, we'll say. I want to say 2008 to like 2013 or so. Um, it was part of a line called the Vintager series. Um, you can tell that they have an obviously kind of retro design and so on. Um, the old school like pseudo Bakelite knobs and the, the external meters and stuff like that. Um, and it turns out that these are really, really good compressors. Um, so they had several um, products in this line. They had a, a tube preamp, they had a, a parametric EQ, um, a sonic maximizer type thing. So like the BBE sonic maximizer trash. Um, I've kind of joked about those with uh, people on the stream before, um, but they're kind of a running kind of weird thing in the audio field. Um, and then they had, um, I forget what the thing is called, but it's literally just eight knobs and eight meters. And it's just eight tube preamps with just one control. Um, and it's, it's uh, called the warmth control. And it basically controls um, a mix between just a clean transistor sound, or it's actually op amps, but it's solid state. And then as you turn the knob up here, it brings in more of the tube sound and kind of adds a little bit of very slight distortion in second harmonics. Um, really interesting effect. I'm not too sold on how much it improves my audio. I've done tests with this. Um, this unit is audio wise, it is 100% fully functional. Um, all the knobs work. There is one broken switch here. Um, I've looked at the circuit and I don't think I care about it yet. Um, it controls the noise gate release time. Um, and the way that it's broken um, is the way that I like it. So I don't know if I'll uh, fix that up, maybe eventually, but I want to find a perfectly matching switch. See how these have kind of, uh, kind of uh, square handles. It's kind of the bat handle type thing. Um, I'm not going to replace that switch unless I can find an exact replacement. Um, so uh, this thing um, on the market today um, still sells for about 200 to 240 bucks, depending on who's selling. Um, and I paid a fellow a grand total of $10 USD for this thing. Um, very nice guy. He had two of them. One of them worked perfectly that he was selling for 125 and then this one was broken, big quotes on that. Um, and he was like 10 bucks and it's yours. And he just wanted to have it find a good home. Um, so what's wrong with this thing? Um, as reported and as sold to me, um, the, the report was that the one and three meters were dead and that the three and four meters had no lights. And then also there actually are tubes in here um, it's not a tube emulation, any bullshit like that. It's real vacuum tubes, and we'll crack the case and take a look inside in a little bit. Um, but there are two lights that light up behind the tubes. It's, it's pretty uh, just kind of blingy, um, but those lights are also burnt out. Um, so what I'd like to do tonight, um, my goal is to try to see if we can get some sort of lighting going on behind these. Um, these actually all used incandescent little tiny grain of wheat bulbs, um, which I don't have any in stock. I actually should because more electronics than I expect use these little fuckers, but I don't have any tonight. Um, so what I'm thinking is that we're going to take some red LEDs. Um, we're going to make little tiny circuits to put inside the meters, 
and we're going to see if we can get these last two to light up even if they're a different color than these two we've got lighting and then um, i'll probably go back off camera and make all four the same red color um, i i have yellow red white green blue all different colors but i think red's going to look pretty cool on this um, especially since all the leds on here for like the compressor kicking in and stuff it's all like a red or a green yellow red type scheme um, and we can maybe even, yeah, play with it and see if we like red or amber or green, um, more. Um, I've got a shitload of LEDs. They're two cents a piece and I'm not messed up about, you know, burning a couple just to see how they look. Um, before we do that, I'm going to go into the quote unquote dead meters here. Um, so these meters, um, did not work when I tried. Um, I could tell the audio was going through and flowing. Um, but the channel two meters, so these two meters here, they did twitch and they did work when I yelled into my microphone, um, but these did not. So I got to thinking, um, what kills analog meters? So if you're not familiar with these meters, they're called Darsenival meters. Um, it's the common moving needle analog meter that you've seen on tons of electronic gear um, throughout the years. Um, you know, people like the to just make things with the LED bars or whatever today. But back in the day, if you wanted to read out a some sort of meter reading, you would use these analog meter circuits. Um, all they are is a, a small coil of very, very, very hair thin wire wrapped around a little bobbin. The needle is attached to that. And then they are suspended between a couple of permanent magnets. And the deflection, how much it twitches is directly proportional to how much current is passing through the meter. Um, they're very, very sensitive. To give you an idea, these are the standard current for a meter, um, which means that um, at full scale, they uh, will flow about 500 microamps or one half milliamp of DC current. So they are responsive to very, very, very small signals. Um, that relatively large coil of very super thin, tiny wire um, makes a, a, a very sensitive uh, uh, movement for the meter. So you can put it just tiny, tiny bits of current through these and they will deflect. That was really important back in the day, um, especially in the day of tube circuits, because back when you had an all tube amplifier or something like that, you didn't have much current available to drive things. Tubes are high voltage, low current devices. So a tube uh, that outputs 100 watts of uh, audio power, for example, is probably going to run about 650 to 700 volts, but it's going only going to be flowing like 20 or 30 milliamps of current. So you don't have much to work with. So the fact that these would work in a circuit without, we call it loading down the circuit and, you know, like sucking a bunch of current from it, means that they were great ways to keep track of your various you know amplifier outputs so on and so forth without changing the sound of your actual amplifier um so uh i got to thinking what would kill analog meters in a commercially produced device now i pulled up the schematic and we're going to go through the diagram in a little bit and I saw that there were basically um, small protection circuits on all these meters because when you're running devices like this, you might have the shit cranked. You might have the output at like plus 20 dB and have the limiter at plus 10 and have this warmth cranked and it's going to have that meter pegged really, really hard. If you run these meters with too much current, they will permanently break and burn out. So standard practice when you're manufacturing a circuit with these things is to have a little bit of limiter so that there is a practical max to how much current will flow through there no matter what. And I looked at the diagram and I saw that they had properly put limiter circuits on all four of these meters. So that indicated to me that this probably was not a situation of somebody ran a guitar too loud through this or something indicated to me that there was probably a mechanical problem with it. And I looked in really closely at the face of the meters and I could tell that on this meter and on this meter, the needles, instead of being perfectly vertical, they're supposed to be vertical and parallel with that meter face. They were cocked out a little bit towards me. 
and they were sticking on the front glass of the meter. Um, now these, these meter movements, they have zero torque. They don't have any twist capability. They have to be perfectly like free moving. As a matter of fact, these use like, like tiny bits of sapphire for the center bearings there. Um, that's how low friction and low torque these devices are. And I was like, well, that's probably the problem. So what I've done off camera is I pulled out the one and three meters here and I carefully disassembled them. It was a very hair raising operation because if you bend that needle once too far, it kinks, it snaps off and your meter is ruined. Um, I like the laser pointer idea. <laughs> I can do this actually. I have a extendable thing. <laughs> I like the uh, I like the laser pointer idea because my autofocus camera sucks. This is eventually going to get fixed. I like the the uh, C920s um, in a static situation, um, but they do get super autofocusy and they kind of freak out. Um, but what I would like to do is to get either some DSLRs or some Sony Handycam type deals and use those because you can lock focus on them. Um, so, anyways, back to the meters. I noticed that uh, around here. These, uh, these were bent out, so I took the meters apart, carefully took a pair of needle nose pliers, and I did my very best to get the needles back parallel to the meter face. Um, and I reassembled them, and by God, they started twitching like perfect. Um, another problem was that this number one meter here, um, its resting spot was about the 20% spot on the scale. Um, so I was like, well, what's up with that? And all of these things, let me get a pointy screwdriver here to point here. All four of these meters have adjustment screws in the middle. This is another standard feature. You can see it better on that one here. Let me light it up. You can see here, there are little adjustment screws here. Um, so I, I tried turning the, the uh, screw on this one and the needle didn't move up or down anywhere. And I was like, well, that's weird. It might be cosmetic. So then I got to thinking, why would they put cosmetic adjustment screws that move on there, right? Because if you're wanting to have, you know, the look and feel of an old school analog meter, you've gone to the trouble of putting an analog meter in, and then you have the adjustment screw just be a dummy screw. You're probably not gonna do that, but if you do, it's just gonna be a molded piece of plastic. It's not gonna actually turn. So that indicated to me that this is probably a functional adjustment screw that is, for some reason, not adjusting the meter. Um, so inside the meter, and we're gonna actually see that closer up as we um, crack these open. We're gonna open up those three and four meters and try to put lights in. Um, there's a little cam that acts on a little arm and uh, that was disengaged on the number one meter. So that was stuck in wherever the internal um, actual mechanism was. So I took it, carefully lined it up, and lo and behold, the zero meter, the meter zero screw started to work again. Um, so we've done a little bit of work on this already, um, and I'm very happy with where we are. Like I said, the circuitry works perfectly. Um, see if this thing will play nicely. Yeah, sort of. Um, I can make it focus with the flashlight, that's weird. So uh, going left to right, um, we have uh, three or four different components of this compressor. Um, the first is a, uh, a noise gate or a downward expander, actually. Um, so this is meant to um, basically turn the volume down when the input goes below a certain level. This is very important for uh, spoken word stuff like Twitch streaming because um, in the pauses in between your words, there's ambient noise around and there's little, you know, you know, like my fan noise down there and stuff like that. Um, and it makes a huge difference if you have a circuit that basically hard cuts the audio whenever you're not talking. Um, so that's what the downward expander does. Um, there's a less feature filled version called a noise gate, which is just like a switch. It turns the audio off when it cuts below a certain level. Those are useful, but they're not as good as a downward expander. The downward expander difference is that I have what's called a ratio knob here. Um, when I'm reading uh, President Beep posts, I normally crank the ratio. Um, <laughs> joke. Um, but this affects 
how much it turns the volume down when you go below a certain level. So if you just have it to two, it's gonna turn it down a little bit. Um, if you turn it up to like four and a half, it's gonna really cut it hard. And then there's an infinite setting which duplicates the functionality of a noise gate. So this is flexible for controlling just that ambient noise coming in off the microphone and so on. Um, the next section is of course the compressor, which is the meat and potatoes of this thing. Um, you got a, um, attack and release. Um, you can set the time on those to how, how fast it's going to adjust the gain. I also have an auto knob that just chooses a sane preset. Um, so if you don't wanna mess with attack and release, that takes care of it for you. We've got threshold and, and ratio knobs, again, Tory post, etc., cetera, um, and, and then an output knob. Um, so that's the main strip of it. Beyond there, very nice feature, um, is that it has a couple of peak limiters. Um, limiters are another important part. Let me see if I can make it focus the light. Yeah, trick didn't work that time. Anyways, um, these two big knobs here are, are the limiters, um, and they will hard cap the volume at a certain level. So if I want to, I can set this limiter at zero dB, and literally scream into the microphone, and the output level is not going to be um, above zero dB ever. It has very fast attack, so it'll just like cut, like hard cut it, and that way you don't overdrive your input, and say you really wanna get up on the microphone and do that loud close talk thing, it's not gonna distort the audio when it goes into the digital part of the chain, which is where levels are important. Um, these things are meant to be run hot, plus six, plus 12 dB. You wanna kinda of push the circuitry a little bit. You get some nice kind of compression there, you get some nice overtones, and it sounds hotter and it sounds fuller and stuff like that. So what you do is you run this thing hot to where it's cranking out like plus eight or plus 10 dB, and then you set this limiter where you want the output level, and that hard caps it and lets you run the rest of the channel strip hot, and then this keeps it you know, nice and friendly to your digital input or whatever. Um, so uh, the final thing is this little tube, um, what do they say on here, warmth? So these are the mixes for the little tube circuit in here. Um, it's just a zero to 100 knob. Um, on zero, the tubes are completely out of the circuit. Um, on 100, the tubes are completely in the circuit. Um, so I've done some tests. Um, it doesn't sound like a, you know, you know, like a distortion pedal or anything like that. Um, but it does just kind of make it sound a little bit brighter and hotter. It adds like some some high harmonics and stuff like that. Makes it more interesting. Um, I think that on 10, it's way too artificial. Um, I've, I've done lots of tests with my good mic here, my Shure copy, um, feeding into this. Um, I don't like it cranked, but I do like it up about 20 or 30%. Um, it kind of brings my, uh, my uh, voice up a little bit. Um, good question from Bobby on output levels. Um, good news, there are two standards for pro audio output levels. Um, there's minus 10 and plus 4 dB. I might have those mixed up. Anyways, um, the lower level is more commonly what you'll see on like line level for like uh, uh, home stereos and stuff like that. Um, kind of cheaper lower end gear. And then the higher level um, is going to be uh, more pro audio. They want hotter levels on pro gear. Um, so this is actually switchable. We'll turn it around and take a look at the back anyways. Cause that's always fun. Hang on, smacked a button on my ham rig because I don't have enough desk space. Um, so going to the back of the unit here, um, you can see the level switches. And yeah, it is minus 10 dB um, peak level there. And then you push the button in and it's plus 4 dB. Um, and that's relative to 1 volt. Um, so yeah, um, various interfaces um, talking about actually bringing it into a digital um, part of the chain. Um, most of your cheaper sound cards are going to look for uh, minus 10 dB, and that's relative to one volt. So how that's calculated, this output, you put a 600 ohm resistor across it, and um, it's relative to one volt of output. So on minus 10, max output is only 100 millivolts of output. Um, it's a little bit low. Whereas if you have it on plus four, that's again relative to one volt of output. Um, so you're looking at, um, oh, I don't know, 
uh, uh, 2.8 to 3 volts. No, let's see. Yeah, doubled is 3 dB. So we're going to take 1 volt, add 3 dB, that's 2 volts. And then add 1 more dB, um, which is going to bring it up to like 2.5 or 3 volts peak output. So you have, uh, you know, like a, like a 30 to 1 almost difference in the output voltage when you punch this switch. Um, most of my gear here is set for the plus 4 because you can run things hotter. You can have higher levels going through, which means that less of the noise in each box is, is, is going to come through. That noise is effectively 14 dB less when you're running those hot pro levels. Um, so... Fortunately, um, I've got the switches for that. This is going to tie in with the rest of the setup, the mixer and all that really, really well. Um, so I'm super excited about that. Um, I've got XLRs. Um, like I showed you, I bought dozens of XLR connectors. So this is all going to be cabled up, start to almost finish fully balanced. Um, balanced audio is where you have a positive and a negative for your audio and then a separate ground wire. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, but uh, for now, just say, hey, XLR and three pin balanced audio is the way to go because it cuts down noise, um, which really helps when you're shitting out 100 watts of RF energy from your ham radios. Um, so we're gonna go fully balanced all the way up to the sound card. Like I mentioned, the sound card has RCA inputs and outputs. Um, so, uh, it's unbalanced. So it's just a hot line and then a ground. Um, so coming out of the mixer, we are going from balanced to unbalanced. It's not gonna hurt that much because those cables are gonna be short and they're gonna be shielded and so on. Um, so it's not gonna be a fully balanced audio path, but all the way from my microphone, through my compressor, through the mixer, so on and so forth, is gonna have that nice noise rejection type setup. Um, so, uh, We've been going for just under an hour. I'm going to go ahead and take a break because I am really proud of the uh, Be Right Back video clip. Uh, we're going to take a quick break um, and then we're going to rip this some bitch open. I'm going to start poking around with it, tear, tear, uh, take those meters apart, um, check some voltages, and then design little tiny circuits to drive LEDs where they had light bulbs. Hopefully we'll have a little bit of success. Um, so yeah, we're gonna take five right now, um, and uh, I'm going to be right back, and we're gonna break out the golden screwdriver and start to mess with this wonderful piece of $10 Craigslist grab. Um, so uh, I'll be back in about four or five minutes.
I've been having problems with Streamlabs. Occasionally it won't play a layer of video, um, which is why, uh, switch to a different view, which is why they got cut off. That's actually supposed to scroll across the screen. But Streamlabs decided to be a freaking jackass and not actually play that video clip. So apologies for that. We're still working on stuff. Maybe I need to use a different codec or something. Um, I think it's a little cranky with raw video. <laughs> um, the transparency stuff has to be rendered in QuickTime with an alpha channel. Um, so I figured out how to do that. Um, but sometimes the encoding to uh, H.264 kind of messes it up. So I've tried sticking with the raw AVI. Um, and sometimes I think that that's just too big a piece for Streamlabs to uh, chew on. Um, so that's why that didn't scroll, but it's supposed to scroll up and across and all that stuff. So thank you for calling that out. Um, we'll get that fixed and hopefully shine things up. I'm still happy with my graphics for uh, uh, only first touching After Effects four days ago. So, you know. Um, so let's get started with this thing. Um, what I'd like to do first, because we're going to probably need to poke around inside. Don't you love this here? These are actually vents. They actually cut Behringer as vents into the top of the unit. Um, kind of cute, whatever. They did spend a little bit more effort on this than they would like one of their like $79 compressors. These retailed for like $279 or something back in the day. Um, so, you know, they did a little bit more effort than the standard uh, Behringer crap gear. So let's find a screwdriver and let's just start popping screws off. I have opened this up so nothing's really stuck. Mm -hmm. Tell you what, let's see. Yeah, there's a there's a net on, but it's the preppers, and a lot of them have really shitty signals. Um, so I'm not going to turn the radio up. We'll just kind of chit chat, go through all the stuff here. It's hard to. Hard to capture all the unscrewing, but I'm just I'm just pulling screws out of the top and the sides and the rear here. And we'll get this cover off and we'll look inside. And there's a fun surprise inside these boxes. Like I said, I've cheated a little bit, cracked this thing open and done some work on it. So I know what it looks like inside, kind of what the structure is. Um, so. You come out here. Don't want to drop any screws. I'm super bad about dropping screws out. Um, so I'm trying, yeah, no, no mealworms. You know, okay, hang on. I was really disappointed with the mealworms um, prank. As some of you know, uh, in a Secret Santa a few years ago on the forums, um, somebody got sent a Dreamcast that was full of dried, dead mealworms. And I was like, damn, yo, that was effort. It's horrible, disgusting shit, but that's effort. Oops, I dropped a screw. See? There we go. That's electronics repair for you. But I will find it later. Damn it. Anyways, mealworms. Um, so I was at King Supers one day, and I was in the pet aisle. This was at a grocery store. And I saw a $3.99 bag of dried mealworms for your reptile or whatever. And I got mad, because, like... That wasn't even a high effort prank. They didn't even go to a pet shop or a bait shop or whatever. They just went to the grocery store and bought a bag of mealworms and then put it in a Dreamcast. So, uh, in my opinion, a little bit shameful. Um, so, three screws on each side. Those are out. Two on the top. Those are out. And there we go. You want to see what's inside a compressor? Get ready for a funky surprise. Actually, I have a couple of those things from Harbor Freight, the little uh, trays that are magnetic. They're really good, and I just have them out by the motorcycle now, and they're full of bike screws, but I need to get a couple more for the bench. So let's pull this cover off, and ta-da, there's nothing in it. And that's a kind of punctuation clang as I drop the thing on the side here. I still have all my gear that I did for show and tell on the side. The, Shack's a mess right now. Um, so this is what's inside. All of the circuitry, the stuff that actually does stuff, is just on one circuit board inside this little sub-assembly. Um, this is a power supply. What's interesting about this, this box is that they actually went through the effort of putting what's called a linear power supply in. 
So if you're familiar with like a PC power supply or anything like that, you 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 may know that they're called um, switching power supplies. Um, long story short, switching power supplies take your 60 hertz coming in, and they change it into like 15 kilohertz, very high frequency power. And then they send it through a tiny, tiny transformer, much smaller than this, for example, for the same rated switching power supply, and then output that to a more complex, this is called a rectifier board. Um, the downside of switching power supplies is that they shit out noise. They shit out audio noise, they shit out RF interference, um, unless you spend a lot of engineering time to kind of put all that like filtering on and suck all that bad noise and hiss out, um, they will screw up your audio chain or they will screw up your RF chain. So Behringer actually did the right thing and used a linear power supply, which means that 60 Hertz power comes in, is sent through a big honk and heavy transformer, and then is rectified to audio. We use this type of power supply to turn AC into DC for decades. Um, and we stopped because this is by far the most expensive and the heaviest part of a linear power supply, the transformer. It's made of iron. Um, you have to have a certain amount of iron to uh, make a transformer that can pass a certain amount of power. And with a switcher, you can save tons of money on your like bill of materials and your parts budget by using a little tiny transformer. Um, and yes, good point, Butcher. Copper got expensive too. So this has a bunch of copper windings. Um, they're relatively heavy gauge. Um, you can kind of see in here, that's pretty decent sized wire. Um, that's like a 22 or 20 gauge wire. Um, not cheap compared to the super kind of uh, optimized low budget design that switching power supplies will let you do. Um, so I was excited to see this because it showed that they, show, they um, had a, at least a modicum of care when they built this unit. Um, you can see that there's some heat sinks here on the rectifiers. There's just little aluminum heat sinks, but fairly effective. There's no fans in this. Um, Interesting that they have a fan cut out for 80 millimeter here and the holes are punched and ready to go. Um, I, I'm thinking that they probably made a design choice to put that in, in case this ran too hot. Um, uh, so the power, the uh, output wires, yes, there are many different voltages going on here. Um, yeah, their hot glue kind of failed. That's where you see the Behringer quality. <laughs> um, so this has a lot of voltages um, coming out um, it's got uh, five volts for some low level circuits that don't need to uh, have much uh, power signal going through them. Um, it's got some 15 volt, if I recall, um, circuits in here. Um, and then some uh, both plus 17 and minus 17 volts coming out for more for most of the audio circuitry. Um, they use the positive and negative voltages for a lot of the audio chain in here um, because that lets you make make amps that are very symmetrical. So you have a negative rail as well as a positive one. Um, good design. And then finally, um, because they actually have, let's take a look at our little bottles here. They have two 12AX7 tubes in this thing. Um, and, and those are what kicks in when you turn the warmth knobs up. Um, these are not cosmetic gimmicks. These actually work. Um, and they power them with, um, if you recall, play, um, tubes need high voltage, low current. Because this is a preamp situation, they don't need really high voltage on this. So the tubes get fed, uh, if I recall, 48 volts out of this power supply. So you have at least uh, four or five different voltages coming out of this power supply board. Um, and some of it goes back here. Um, this does a bunch of the switching for the audio in and out back here on this board, which is bolted into the back panel. Um, and then what, you know, like I said, the vast majority of the actual compressor circuitry is underneath this plate. We fortunately don't need to rip this out because the compressor works, the limiter works, the downward expander works. Um, the only reason that I would ever st st strip it down to that level while wow, my camera's hating these light differences, um, is if I want to replace the switch. We have to pull all that out and solder a new switch. Um, all the controls are soldered directly to that board. It's mounted vertically inside. Um, 
but uh, we're going to skip that because we don't have to. Um, and then here we have two little incandescent light bulbs. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, those are what backlight the tubes. Normally tubes glow when they're turned on. Um, but uh, because this is a low voltage circuit, you don't really get much pretty glow. And they re really wanted to kind of push that aesthetic with this. Um, so they just put light bulbs behind the tubes. It does look cool when they're lit up, um, but it's not necessary at all for the functionality. Um, and because they're little tiny, you know, bulbs, they are burnt out. Um, so I'm gonna pull those out for right now because we know that they're not working. Um, what I'd like to do is eventually get replacements for those. Um, but the thing is, is that they're oddly enough, 24 volt bulbs. And because they're powered off of that 48 volt rail, they're in series. So you have two bulbs in series, they're each pulling 24, that, that adds up to 48. Um, so it'd be really strange and kind of weird to build a, um, like an LED uh, circuit to go in there. Um, you'd need a pretty large value resistor and it might look weird. So down the road, I'm gonna order a couple of bulbs, like actual replacements to put in there and I'm gonna use the stock incandescent setup back there. Now, moving on to what we're actually gonna to do today is pulling these meters out. Um, specifically these two because the lighting is shot on these. Um, I have cheated. Um, it's hard to see on there, but each meter is held in with a couple of hex heads. And I know that it is a two, is it two? Two millimeter hex wrench. So step one, let's yank these meters out. Like I said, this number three meter was one of the ones with the bent needles. So I've already pulled this bad boy out, fiddled with it and reinstalled it. And yeah, I apologize. I know the autofocus just sucks on here. Let me see if I can, I can pull back and do a little bit of a sanity check on the focus and get it to stop freaking out. There we go. Now I am going to be very, very careful with those screws because I don't want to fish those out of my carpet. And there's no nuts on these. They actually tapped holes in the in the aluminum faceplate, which uh, again, a little bit higher quality than your standard uh, German crap Behringer gear. So at this point, the meter just pulls out. You can see it's on a little little pigtail there, which we do need to fiddle with a little bit. Um, a couple of them are hot glued in inside there. Maybe my light will help a little bit. You can see there, there's a little four pin header, same as a PC header that they've used for connectivity between the meters. And uh, yeah, actually that's what the windows are. Those are meant to light up um, behind them. So that's why the little clear plastic windows are there. So in the end, I'm gonna have bulbs back behind the tubes. They're gonna light up and glow super pretty and this thing will be in full bling mode. Um, but for today, I'm expecting this to take up most of the stream. So I'm going to just see if I can work out and this is the tricky part because I don't have a good angle on it. There we go. Boom. And we have a meter. Set that aside and let's go ahead and pull out the second one. By the way, thank you to everybody that's followed me. Um, some of the more astute of you have noticed that I have hit the floor for affiliate of 50 followers. Please do not unfollow me. Um, <laughs> so I hit 50 followers and as of today's stream, I have met all of the uh, requirements to become a Twitch affiliate. Um, so we're gonna be setting that up very soon which of course makes things a little bit more fun. We get an emote for the channel. We're still debating what to use um, in that slot. And uh, 
Though it's not important to me, I will then have the ability to take bits if you want to tip me for my stupid crap that I do on camera. Um, so very exciting news. The stream has gone off way better than I expected. I was planning on one or two people to just kind of hang out and pity watch me. And it uh, turns out that I got a little gang of uh, solder heads that love, love hanging out here a couple days a week. So thank you sincerely for all that. Um, super excited. Like I said, I never thought this would be as hot as it as it is, and uh, I have all of you to thank for that, for believing in me. Um, so here we have, it's hard to see, there's a pretty considerable, oh yeah, there, there we go. There's a considerable gloop of hot glue on this one. Um, the... Uh, the skilled engineers adhesive of choice. I'm going to carefully, carefully grab that. Okay. Get that horrible hot glue out. Cast it into the depths of hell from whence it came. And then work this connector loose a little bit. And just go kind of side by side. If you've ever worked a, a pin header that's like super tight out, you know that the, the method for success is just kind of get it side by side. Because that's down in the hole a little bit, I can't just pull straight. There we go. Alrighty. So, you have a couple of meters out here. And I don't have any loose screws on here, so what we can do for now, get my camera out of the way, set this aside so that I can slice my foot open when I forget on the next break. And now we take a look at these meters. Um, so I wasn't sure how to get into these, but I knew that they rarely assemble these in, in a uh, non-fixable way. Um, always remember that um so I was like how do I get into this um and I figured out that if I take my knife Columbia River also a sponsor of the show um take the knife and we just kind of pry this barrel part out this faceplate is going to come out um but we need to be very careful because the faceplate holds the face that actual like white face of the meter in and um, so we can accidentally bend the needle if we just take this and just yank it off once it's loose. So we're gonna work carefully here and just kind of get this thing popped loose. And it's easier than I thought, actually. Don't need to like worry about left versus right on this. So it's now loose. And you see here that the needle slips out from there and the faceplate this actually is just a piece of plastic comes out and then we have our meter movement and if i get my light we can, we can poke around in here a little bit and you can see in there that you have that uh, come on focus that's about as good as we're going to get um but you you have the coil of wire there and the, the needle will do some wobbling as you tap on it, so on. Um, it's very low friction, just kind of hanging out there, but it does tend to rest at that zero point. Um, so our next step is going to be um, to remove the meter movement from the case. Pull back, force focus. Come on, asshole. There we go. We're going to pull the meter movement out. There are two screws that hold it in. Screw one there. And screw two there. Be gentle with this stuff. None of it was manufactured with a brute force approach. And there we have the actual meter movement in here. Um, you can tell it's, it's lots of magnet and 
a fair amount of wire. It's hard to see how fine that wire is, but it's seriously like uh, 40 or 46 gauge. It is, it is about the thickness of a human hair, and there's a lot of windings on there. Um, and that's what makes these so sensitive. Um, and then back behind there, see deep down inside, those were the light bulbs that are currently burned out in this thing. Um, and it is our goal tonight to A, figure out how to get these things out. And just looking down in there, I think we can just desolder them. We're about to find out, speaking of which. Hot solder, got to turn the soldering iron on. Back, uh, back in the day, I would always call out because it's very important to uh, practice solder safety. Um, soldering irons can start fires, they can burn the shit out of people and kitties, which was my primary concern. Um, but uh, I would always call out hot solder and the person living with me would yell out old solder balls because that was my nickname when I was soldering. So we've got the meter moving on this one out. Let's go ahead and move on to the second one. Yeah, meters are super, super tiny, super precision devices. They have to be made very small and very accurately um, in order to work properly. Got some curls of smoke coming off. Um, one thing that I am proud to mention is that I bought new soldering iron tips. If you came by for the, uh, the AM radio build, um, y'all remember this little guy, right? Um, I had a horrible huge wedge tip on my iron and it was kind of kind of clumsy to get down to the uh, the last parts on the build there because my soldering iron tip was just so big and I'd hit like three joints at once. I mean I normally hit three joints at once right um, <laughs> um, but uh, I went ahead and bought a pack of replacement tips for my iron. So this one had a little bit of hot glue on there and they just tried to lock it down a little bit. And again, we gotta be very, very careful to pull it out and get that, get that face plate between. And that's out. I'll go ahead and try to keep these parts distinct even though these are probably interchangeable. Let's try not to screw up the individual parts on the left and right sides. I say that as I put the screws for that one over there. There we go. Keep things organized. I mean, after a certain part, entropy kicks in when you're working on a bench. Um, shit just gets weird and stuff goes everywhere. Usually when I'm in like mid project, oh, my hair's doing a funky little flip thing. When I'm in like mid, like mid project, like I can't even get up from my like chair because I have like meter leads running across and like a power cable snaking up my leg. And like you get like like basically entombed in this project, um, and that just happens once you get uh, all your test gear out and stuff like that. Um, but it's good to try to try to counteract it as much as possible. And so this is interesting here. We may we may not even have to replace these bulbs because of my discovery just now it's hard to see but that lead on that bulb right there has become disconnected from the terminal this bulb is only hanging on by one wire so I'm wondering what happened to this unit because okay so we have one busted relatively fine gauge wire um, inside one of the meter circuits and if you call, we had two needles on the meters that were bent outwards. It's really hard to do that. Um, I haven't noticed like any rack rash or dents or bends on this thing. So I'm wondering why the hell um, we got like some kind of physical trauma here. Um, and I'm going to see, we're going to change plans here live. Fuck it. Do it live. Um, we're going to resolder this bulb back to the terminal. And then I'm going to pop these things back in the compressor. And we're going to see if it starts to light up on these meters. 
Um, because I think, if I recall, that the bulbs for both of these meters are, again, in series. So if, the, if just one of the wires comes desoldered, both of those bulbs would go out. And as I'm talking through it, this starts to make sense um, that both of those would go out at the same time because it's statistically unlikely that those little grain of wheat bulbs, which are very, very low wattage, so they're like a, a tenth of a watt or so, it's kind of unlikely that both of those would die on a device that's only eight to ten years old. Um, just kind of me thinking through my body of knowledge and so on. Um, so this is starting to make more sense. And it's going to be my guess here live on stream that once we get that soldered back in, get these meters put back together, and then power it up, that both sides are going to light up. So our front panel lighting at least will be back to 100%. So, let's get to it. This may be a shorter, uh, shorter fix than I expected. Get you a little bit more what I'm seeing. See, the problem is that, like, if you're to see exactly what I see, then the camera is literally in my eye. I wish that, uh, like, the Google Glass shit would have taken off more, and that I, like, I could get like a nice, like eyeglass mounted camera or something because I would totally be running that instead of this uh, 920 on a uh, on a mic boom um, yeah this was ten dollars I got a 95 percent discount on average retail on this thing um, because it was broken um, and the guy was super straightforward about it like he even posted in um, in the ad um, hey um, it sounds like it works. I think some of the metering is screwed up. The lights are dead, so on and so forth. If you want to bring your instrument or keyboard, I'll be happy to hook it up. He had a little basic home studio set up. Um, so he, he wasn't trying to sell a pig in a poke or anything. He was upfront about what, uh, what was broken on it. And the fact that he only let it go for 10 bucks um, kind of indicated to me that he was a relatively straight up dude and a very nice guy. Um, this is coming from like church PA land, you know, he's, he's, he's a very wholesome fellow, very nice, very polite. Um, so, uh, you know, I felt good buying it. Um, obviously for 10 bucks, there's not much commitment, uh, that you have to lay down for it. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it was a pretty sweet deal. Yeah, I could just do like a like a helmet mounted or a, a, um, I actually have a GoPro mount so I could mount a GoPro on, on the band of my headphones and then run a GoPro on top and yeah, people would laugh, but it would work. By God, it would work. So I'm going to see if I can get a little bit better. I'm sorry, this is just going to be like a thing that's just kind of down in the shadows because it is hard to see what's going on in here and show it to the camera at the same time. So what I think I'm going to do, I'm going to try to drop a little gloop of solder on the wire. That's the actual, I'm trying to look on the camera. Let me, uh, let me see. I cock my light down a little bit, if that helps at all. Eh, sort of, not really. better. I'm going to get a, a little drop of solder on this and then I'm, I'm going to try not to melt the case on the meter. Um, soldering irons of course will trash plastic like this turbo style but what I'm thinking is that I'm going to um, shout out to Schrodinger's Cat5. We're going to listen to him for once and we're going to use the helping hands to hold this thing. Um, I'm gonna get solder on the on the bulb wire, and then we're gonna just try to try to lock it down to that terminal um, inside here. This is the wire; you can tell it flops freely, sort of. And then the terminal is just a couple millimeters away. So I think if I just quickly pop it with the soldering iron, I should be able to reestablish connection there. So I want to take this. Let's see what the best way to rig this up is. Maybe something like that. I do want to hold this hold this steady while while we're doing the work here. 
legs are cramping up a little bit. Like I said, I did lots of meetings and lots of conferences today and uh, all that. And uh, my dogs are barking. I'm already talked out, like I mentioned. And I'm still, still on here with you all. We're cranking it out. We're fixing shit left and right. Move it up here a little bit. That's actually a pretty good angle. Yeah, I have seen the solder scopes, um, and yeah, you're totally right. Trying to keep focus with one of those might be weird. If we were just doing straight up on a board soldering, um, it'd be one thing, but we're all over the fucking like, place here, so uh, it might be a little bit tricky. Um, and yeah, I don't think y'all can hear that too much, but once my iron is on, because this is a wonderful $27 uh, Chinese soldering iron, it's not even a Hakko 888, um, which I'm probably gonna buy pretty soon. Um, I get a little bit of like 120 hertz buzz whenever I touch the iron. Um, it's just kind of kind of weird. Um, not that big of a deal. So let's see here, we got a nice hot iron. So we're gonna go in here. God, focus. This camera is more frustrating than it was when I just had it on up on the big zoom. Uh, we're gonna go in here. That's all we need, just a little bit. And now, the second challenge is going to be getting the bulb to touch, touch the terminal in there while I can melt up the solder. I'm gonna see if I have maybe a better tool to kind of hold that bulb in place. Because you can't just grab it with pliers, it's very thin glass and so on. Let's try this. Voicemails. This is a little uh, tuning tool from our 2P3 kit. And take that, it's nice and gentle and it has kind of a wide head on it, so. I think, all right, connection has been reestablished. If that's all it takes, six seconds of soldering to fix this, I'm gonna just LOL. So, that's cool, but it only takes a second to cool for a tiny joint like that. So what I think we should probably do next, yeah, it's it seems physically secure there. Um, flakes of hot glue. Please don't assemble electronics with hot glue. Public service announcement. Um, so before we do anything trickier, I do want to go ahead and put the meter movement back in because um, it's so fragile. And I'm just like, I'm super, super paranoid that we're going to bend that needle or we're going to break one of the coil wires. And if we do, we just throw it in the trash. You can't fix that movement if you screw it up. And yeah, I say that as I look away from the thing that I'm working on and check my camera. It's one tricky thing about this stream that I've really had to learn um, because I'm trying to chat with you all um, and so on. Uh, I do try to look up at the stream a whole lot um, so I don't miss chats, but the problem is that it breaks my focus on what I'm actually working on. So it's just a challenge that I've been trying to work through. Oh, Lewis Rossman, yes, that dude. That dude is awesome. Um, and uh, if I bring this in a little bit, uh, bring this in a little bit, you can see that th there is that axis of the needle. And of course, it's not going to focus because that thing's so tiny, the autofocus can't grab it. You can see there the, the plane of the needle, I guess we'd call it, um, relative to the face of the meter. Um, this one is actually out just a little bit. I don't think I'm gonna mess with it. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reassemble this and then I'm going to uh, see if the movement is clean um, and kind of just jiggles around when I shake the meter. Um, if it is, good then we'll go ahead and put it back in the circuit if it's not we will uh 
tweak the needle. And yeah, you can see there that uh, if I hold that on there, you can see that it's it's a couple millimeters out from the face of the of the meter, um, but it does seem to be roughly parallel. Um, you got about four, three or four millimeters of wiggle room on that on that axis of the needle. Um, if it's too far out, it scrapes against the face. If it's too far in, it scrapes against the uh, legend or the internal plastic there. But I think we're good. So we're going to take this, and this is uh, kind of indexed to where it's going to come on, or pop on parallel. Take it and then just carefully snap it in, and you can see there it definitely hops around. So the needle has cleared both the outside glass or, or clear plastic um, faceplate, and it's it's not uh, catching on the back um, legend of the meter. So at least the needle is still fairly aligned well. Um, I don't have to mess with it or bend it um, to bend it like I take pliers like these and don't even twist you just take them slightly off axis and then you just gently squeeze because that's just very thin metal on that needle um, and you just kind of squeeze it whichever way you want to go so uh, this meter is back in place um, what I want to do now um, because we're suspecting that it, it was just a simple continuity thing I do have access to the lighting pins here if I jam my probes in um, make sure that's in there so the center two terminals are the actual voltage that goes to the meter and then the outer two terminals are the lighting um, so I want to see here we take our meter put it in resistance mode and then we're gonna just kinda have to work until we hit metal underneath all that hot glue maybe easy and boom there we go 32 ohms um so it's not a short circuit good it's not an open circuit good um and then we're gonna move on to the other meter reassemble it test it to see how relatively uh close in resistance they are if they're both about 32 35 ohms i'm suspecting that this may just come back to life and we may have fixed it without having to mess with leds or anything um, and most importantly, it will be matched. Um, all four lights will be the same without us having to rip out the other two meters for the VU, um, which I'd really like to do um, because I don't enjoy the super precision mechanical work. Um, it's tricky and it's easy to get kind of ham handed with it and you break shit and you can't ever fix it. And I'd really like to bring this thing back to 100%. So in theory, if we get these bulbs lit up again, and then I order a couple of grain of wheat bulbs for the, or not grain of wheat, but they're called like a T2 and a half, the little bayonet bulbs behind the tubes in the compressor. Replace it with that. Um, and then find that switch. Find that switch for that, that uh, downward expander release. If we find a switch and we can replace it, um, maybe in a week or so, we can bring, bring this thing back up to 100% factory. Um, before I put it together, let's call out the meter adjustment circuit here. You see this little slotted thing here. This is how you adjust the zero on the meter. Um, the screw on the front of the face has an off-center pin. So as you turn it, that pin wiggles left and right, and that pin uh, pops right into that slot cut in the adjustment zero circuitry. And as you turn it left and right, you can adjust exactly where the resting point of the meter is. So we're gonna take this and find that kind of index spot where it's parallel, take it, and then snap it in. Nice satisfying click there. And you can see that the needle still wiggles. So again, it's not bent forward or backwards too much. Um, and then let's take it and Let's test that uh, resistance on the bulb on this one. Yeah, the needles are absolutely super careful. If you ever have um, any audio gear with uh, needle meters on it,
please be careful with them um, because just the inertia of a hard jolt can bend or break those needles. Um, so we're in resistance mode here. Get you on camera. I said get you on camera. Thank you. And then just kind of jam a probe into that hot glue. Jam a probe down there. Look at that, 33 ohms, the exact same as the other one. So we're in good shape. We're looking real good here. Don't even need the meter for anything else past this point. The exciting part will be on Saturday when I have not only my new mixer set up, but this compressor will be in line and it's going to be my main microphone mixer. Um, and uh, we'll do a little bit of playing around on air with it, show you guys exactly what a compressor does, how it changes the sound. Um, it's pretty dramatic change. Um, my current mixer, the little 802, has a one knob compressor. It's just a super basic little bit of squeeze type thing to level out things. Um, doesn't even compare to uh, like a multi knob compressor where you can change the parameters. Um, I've done just some quick audio tests with my big mic, like I mentioned, and it really, really makes me sound a lot more professional. Um, even though my dulcet tones already project wonderfully on the uh, stream, um, it's going to take it to the next level. Um, and then one entertaining thing is that because I will be going to that compressor for my main microphones, this is one microphone here on my lapel, and then I've got my Shure copy for my radios. Um, because that's a dual compressor, I can run different compression settings for each microphone. And this is important because I have had for years a little Alesis Nano Compressor. That's what I use for my hammer rigs, for the microphone, for the big mic on the boom that feeds into my radios. Um, it's good, it's fine, it's great. It's not really um, that adjustable, like there's no noise gate on it or anything like that. But what it would be good for is to take the feed from the radios and there's a concept called side chaining in compression. And what that means is that you um, reduce the volume of one signal by using the volume of another signal as input. So how, how we're gonna set this up is that um, the radio feeds that we listen to on here, you know, just like that stuff right there, is gonna be running through the little nano compressor and then my microphone will be the side chain input. So whenever I talk, it's gonna automatically turn down the volume on the radios in the background. And when I stop talking, it's gonna slowly bring them back up. Um, and that's like, a thing that you've heard on many radio stations, they use a lot of side chaining, also called ducking, um, to kind of level out things and make sure that when you're talking over a music track, the track is pulled down 6 dB or 10 dB or whatever, and then when you stop talking, the music comes back. So that's what that effect is called. I'm going to be able to set that up, and then that way we can keep the radio volume higher, and when I want to run my biscuit hole and talk about something, it's going to turn that volume down and then back up when I shut up. So, um, let's see. The next step, I guess, is we're going to take these. We're going to set them up here for right now. We're going to reinstall the meters into the compressor. Oof. Hard to pick things up with weird leverage like that. We don't even really need this thing opened up anymore, but it's fun. You want to, you know, fix a piece of gear and hack on it a little bit. You got to have the case off, right? So let's take a look and see. See what we can see here. And again, left versus right doesn't really matter here. They're matched pair. They're not matched, but they just, it doesn't matter which one it is. They're not like wired differently for left versus right. So I need to take a little bit of a look here and see how I'm gonna get these pushed back in. So because the headers are like a centimeter down and one and a half centimeters back, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the harness, it goes in like this, and I'm gonna make a fairly sharp, like an L bend, just kind of use the tension of the wire to kind of provide a little bit of form for it. And then about two centimeters up here, we're going to make a little Z shape here. So I've got that set up and it's going to line up pretty well. We need to actually make this bend a little bit tighter so it has clearance. I'm going to take it and 
can't really get good lighting on that left channel. We're going to put in the left channel first. A grease pencil. That's an interesting proposition. Um, no, I don't really have... Like, that's like a like the, uh, the support stuff like that. That's an interesting suggestion, and I do like it. Um, so, yeah. I'm going to get a couple marking pencils, um, because that is important when you're doing stuff like pulling knobs off and stuff like that. Um, oftentimes, if they're just like a round shaft, you'll lose the index of where zero is. Just trying to get this to where I like, like the angle on it. And we're going to see if we can just get it lined up with that. Once we get it lined up, this is going to be slightly tricky. Let's fail. That tighter. I need to really, really get that sharp 90 bend because there's not that much clearance back there. We don't have much uh, much force that we can apply to kind of force this into place because the wires are stranded and they're just little flexi wires. So let's see if we can do. Sometimes in situations like this, I like to take a sip of beer, breathe, and then try again. Let's see if we can get even more, even more of a sharp bend on there. really don't want to have to disassemble the faceplate just to plug these back in. I believe in myself. I think we can do it. Oh, we're so close here. Booyaka. And that is back in. We'll snap. All right, that meter is reconnected. We're going to take it and we're going to just push it in for now. We'll do screws in a second. And then we take our other meter, kind of do the same thing, get that angle on the wires just right to where it lines up, and then we can apply force to push it in. to get it seated. It's not long enough to go in that way. I need like a screwdriver with like a 15 degree bend right here. It kinda kinda L down into that. That would be perfect. Got it. The pins are lined up. We push. Got to kind of go both sides here. And it's in. Take it, line it up. And then we get our hex wrench and we run these things back in. Whenever you're assembling anything, this is a thing that comes from cars. If you ever like replaced a head gasket or something, one important rule is to tighten your screws evenly. So you just take them and you just lightly get them in there. You don't want to crank down on one when you have multiple screw holes or multiple bolts that you need to torque down. And this is because sometimes you need to line things up. So what you want to do is just use the screws as just kind of little index pins. Make sure that they all thread in. And then you want to try to increase the tension and clamp things down as symmetrically as possible 
so that nothing gets pinched and nothing gets kind of like uh, forced out to a corner or just like like tightened off. So you always do the closest that you can get to an X pattern. I'm not cranking down on these much, just enough to to where I feel that they're not going to work loose when I'm pumping out 12,000 watts of sick ass drum and bass mixes and the whole room is shaking. Left side, let's get these screws just kind of in there, threaded in. Aircraft avionics, that shit is amazing. I love aircraft uh, electronics. Um, it's built to very high and very precise standards. It's tough to work on, and if you fuck up, people die. It's a very cool suggestion. I would love to do something like that um, if I wasn't already 20 years deep in my existing career. That final screw. So all of our screws are lined up. And we go back and we cross tension things nice and evenly. A lot of times what happens is things don't sit completely flat without a little bit of screw tension. Like here, I kind of did finger tight earlier on the first screw. And I got a good three turns off it after all the others were in place because they pulled them into the faceplate nice and flat. Um, and now we can crank down on everything. Uh, thanks for asking, Darkstar. I am a support engineer for a company called Fastly. Um, we're a... Um, the official word is we're an edge cloud provider that provides CDN, um, but uh, you may just know what a content delivery network is. Um, but uh, long story short, about 10% of all web requests, web, web requests go through our cache servers. So if you ever go to the New York Times or Reddit or anything like that, you're not actually talking to their web servers. You're talking to our cache servers. Um, and if we don't have an item cached, we go and pull it from what's called their origin servers. Um, and uh, we're a very successful company. I love my job. I work with some truly great people. Um, it is a whole bunch of fun. I've done various DevOpsy, SRE type stuff through the days. Um, so, um, and actually came back to support. Yeah, see, I got another half turn off that screw after things pulled back in. Cool. All right, things are good. I'm happy with those meters. Um, but yeah, I absolutely love my job. The reason that I don't do this stuff um, as a profession um, is because I love it so much. Um, I am I am good at um, uh, you know closing support tickets, and I'm good at uh, Unix, Linux type stuff, networking, so on. I'm a former CCNA, which side note, that's the best type of CCNA to be. Um, you don't want a current cert because people are like, you're going to be our network janitor. But if you have an expired CCNA. You've proven that you know the material, but you're above it. Um, so I don't get bugged for network janitor shit anymore, but everybody knows that I know it. And I think that's the sweet spot. Um, so uh, I stick with kind of the IT techie stuff to pay the bills, and then I do this stuff to decompress and enjoy my evenings. And uh, seems to be a, a nice, good match for me. Um, and I enjoy it a whole lot. So um, gosh, folks. It's Mormor. It's uh, Mormor. It's Mormon of Truth time. It's moment of Truth time. Before we put the case on and button this thing up and call it good, I have what I believe to be a power cable here. Oh yeah, little neat thing about this compressor: um, the inputs and outputs are actually relay switched. Um, so this is not only a power switch, but it's a bypass switch. Um, so if this thing's in your rack and you uh, have it turned off, you still get just basic audio through it. Um, that's a really nice thing and a nice feature. Um, so you can just turn it off. So power is off. Let us find our cord. Try not to shock ourselves while we plug it in. And let's see if we work the magic. You ready for this? Holy shit, we did it. That was it. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. Yes, we fixed this thing with one solder joint, no replacement parts. Um, hell yeah. Look at those beautiful meters. Whenever I play my like my my like lit, like latest mixtape through this, that needle just pins. I've tried it. The knobs have no effect. 
my mixtapes are just way too hot. Um, so yeah. Oh yes. I'm so happy. Um, so the only thing that's wrong with this are two dead light bulbs, which I can buy as commodity items, um, off of Amazon. They're like two bucks, um, for like a five pack actually. And then this switch, which a, I don't really care about B, um, I should be able to find a replacement. We may do that in a future fix. Um, but that's honestly going to be like a whole bunch of grunt work. I'm going to have to rip this whole thing apart, do 30 seconds of soldering, and then put the whole damn thing back together. I'm not sure how stream friendly that's going to be. Um, so the jury's still out on that switch replacement. Um, as is, I'm fucking tickled pink about this thing. We've got a super nice compressor. Um, yeah, so we did it. Um, I'm glad that we carefully looked at the meters. So, so this is a good lesson to know what the problem is before you attempt to fix it. So I had this whole plan. I had my like rack of LEDs and my resistors out and we were gonna desolder those bulbs. And you saw how tight it was in that meter housing with the super delicate movement, like, like you know, flopping around in there. Um, I was planning to try to fit one LED and one resistor in each of the meter housings, um, which would have been a good stream sucker that would have been all that we did tonight um and i might not have even finished and that work was precise enough that i very possibly could have screwed something up um so we adhered to the um principle of mess with it the least amount possible and we were successful and i just pinched that hurt really badly i am biting my tongue right now i got pinched between the top cover Please don't report me for self-harm. That was not intentional. <laughs> oh, God. A-plus certification. That's out of the fucking freezer, yo. Oh, I haven't even thought about A-plus in years and years and years. Oh, wow. You yeah, got a little bruise coming up. Yes. Okay, so we're done with this thing for now. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just start running screws back in. We're going to take a five minute break. And yeah, that was, that was basically the blood price of fixing this, this unit. Um, it took a little bit of blood sacrifice. Um, not even real blood, just a little bit of pain. And that's very frequently how it goes. You know what I'm glad I didn't hit? The soldering iron. Um, when I was like 12 years old, I was over at a buddy's house and we were soldering up a couple electronic kits. And I wasn't looking, and I straight up grabbed the wrong end of the soldering iron. Um, it was really bad. They actually had to take me to the ER, and I had this big all the way across my palm. Um, and I learned my lesson. That smell of burning flesh, um, it's horrible, and it's worse when you know that it's yours. So Actually, I broke my rule here. Remember how I was talking about tightening screws evenly? I cranked down too much on the rear ones, and the the top panel is a little misaligned. So we just got these barely, barely in there. And then we're gonna get all the screws sort of, sort of started. And then we're gonna go around and evenly tighten them all. So there's no stress on the chassis and everything's properly seated. And I could be using a larger screwdriver for this, honestly. That one doesn't wanna go in. Maybe I need to. Oh. Okay, two things. First of all, make sure you're putting the right screws in. Second of all, turn off your soldering iron, especially when you're bragging about not touching the soldering iron. I didn't actually touch it, but I did touch that metal coil, um, which is, you know, it's a safety thing, uh, but uh, it definitely is not cold. Much better. Those go right in. Um, we can go ahead and turn this off for now. We have proven that our fix is functional and good. And that's one less wire to mess with while I bolt this thing back together. And those side screws in, nice. Start them, but don't finish them. If you recall, we are one screw short, but 
I'm going to find that later on because you don't want to see my butt crack as I bend over and try to... Well, you may, but this is a family-friendly stream. But I'm going to find that screw later and run it in. actually slightly different lengths kind of did some annoying annoying stuff there Behringer all right now we go in and we crank down all the screws we start with the back ones so they pull the panel forward tighten them down I, I like my little Harbor Freight mini screwdriver set but I could use something with just a little bit larger handle so that we can kind of crank down a little bit more on these big ones it's perfect for like the meter movements and stuff like that, but not perfect for actual chassis screws, but that's okay. We'll make it work. A little bit of grunt, like the old Arkansas torque wrench we called it. You don't actually own a torque wrench, you just uh, own a ratchet and a breaker bar, and you measure how much torque you're applying to a bolt by what cuss words you yell out when you're cranking on it. So like a little oof, that's like four, like 40 foot pounds, and then son of a bitch, that's 60 foot pounds, and then Jesus, God damn, blah, blah, blah. when you start stringing profanity together, that's when you know the bolt is good and tight. Um, and it more applies to when you're trying to remove bolts, but it also works for installing them. Cool, all right. Success, the 1952 is alive and has some pretty lights. And I'm going to order a couple bulbs so we can get those tubes glowing. And then this thing will be back to basically 100%. So um, we're going to take another five minute break. I don't know if my uh, BRB video is going to work properly again. We're going to find out. Um, and then we'll come back and I'll run for another hour if you guys want to hang out a little bit. Um, we might play a little bit of radio um, and so on. And uh, just kind of have a little bit of fun because uh, the main goals are done. We fixed those lights and I'm feeling pretty good. Um, so uh, I'll be back in just a couple of minutes and we will continue on with the Maddie Zedcast. Be right back. Stupid video.
Hang on, I came on from something. Twenty twenty five, Because we have a special guest. All right. And we are... Back. And Miss Narvel wanted to come say hi. She's very angry that I'm holding her right now. But she wanted to say hi. Yes, I know. This is a good Nargle. This is my kitty cat, for those of you new to me and the stream. This is Nargle Marie Von Fuzzy Bottom, the first, last, and only. I know. Protest. She's not much of a lap cat, but uh, she is a bit of a rock star in, uh, in our little circle, so I wanted to bring her on camera. Hang on. My headphones keep coming unplugged. I didn't make the little pigtail quite long enough. Anyways, we're back. We're rocking it. Um, Nargle Marie Von Fuzzybottom, the first, last, and only. That's her Christian name in full. Because, um, yeah, there can be no other Nargle. Um, Birds, thank you for hanging out. I'm glad you uh, were able to hang out uh, for the fix, and I'm glad that we were able to fix it in time for you to celebrate with us. So uh, thanks for hopping on the stream. And we're going to keep on rocking it. Honestly, um, I didn't have a backup plan for this. I expected that to take the full two hours. Um, so uh, I reckon um, at this point we can uh, spend a little bit of time just hanging out. We'll go uh, kind of a just chatting mode and I'll turn up the radios and we will poke around and see... Uh, Maybe operate a little slow scan or uh, just listen to some old hams on the radio, goof off. And if you guys have any questions about electronics or anything like that, we'll hang out and just kind of kick it. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to kill that. I'm going to bring that up. And then we're going to bring up the shortwave rig. Um, I don't know why I'm on the 160 meter band right now. Um, I think I might have accidentally hit a button, um, but uh, this band is right above the, ooh, that's horrible, it's right above the AM broadcast band, um, it's known as top band, um, from uh, decades and decades ago when we measured bands in meters of wavelength instead of megahertz of frequency. Um, so you didn't operate on the 1.9 megahertz band. You operated on the 160 meter band. And this is, uh, for many years, it was the lowest frequency ham band. One interesting thing about uh, this band is that um, you... Um, a lot of the hams on here are very enamored with sort of the old world of broadcasting and technology. Um, and one big part of that is that you can take an old AM radio transmitter, like something you would get from a station that shut down or whatever, um, and convert it, bring it just a little bit higher. Um, so like we're at uh, 1900 kilohertz or 1.9 megahertz. Um, if you go just a little bit lower to about 1.6, that's where the AM radio band starts. Um, so the, the broadcast AM transmitters are not too far off from this band. So if you go inside and you basically take like two turns off a couple coils, um, those transmitters will come up to this band. So you have a lot of guys, usually they're quite a bit older, um, but they have these like commercial spec broadcast AM transmitters and they transmit amplitude modulation. Um, this is single sideband here, so it's a little bit less natural sounding, but the AM guys, they sound great. And they're the ones that get all the microphones and the compressors set up and they have really good, you know, broadcast quality audio, and they love to hear themselves talk. So they will go for 10, 15 minutes and just kind of just like talk about nothing. But they sound great, and it's really just great to just listen to them. Super chill. Um, but this is kind of where ham radio got its start. Um, is on this band um, because 
technology back then, you couldn't go higher frequency. Not only that, there was no regulation to allow you to go on the higher bands. So this is where everybody hung out. All the hams in like the, the late 20s, early 30s, they were hanging out on, on you know, the, the uh, 160 band. Um, and yeah, it is a very long uh, um, uh, wavelength, which means you need large antennas. Um, so uh, the standard transmitting antenna on this band is called a quarter wave vertical. Um, if you have the land and the resources for it. And I'll get into land and resources in a little bit because it, it does color um, kind of the, the socio-economic, political, whatever aspects of operating radio. But on this band, you need a quarter wavelength vertical to effectively send out a signal. And if you do the math, that quarter wavelength vertical means that you need a, about a 130 foot tall antenna. Generally means that you're gonna need a tower and then you light up the whole tower with RF. You feed that tower against um, a radial field. So you need two sides to every antenna. With a quarter wave vertical, the other half of the antenna, um, so to speak, is um, represented by a bunch of wires that you string out either right on top of or just, just barely underground. And you need um, a quarter wave uh, long wire rotating or um, not rotating um spreading out in all directions from the base of the tower so that means that you need about a 250 by 250 foot field and you put 120 wires or the more's the merrier like four like four wires is barely adequate 16 wires is getting better the guys that are really serious about this band have like 120 of those radials go, like 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 going out every three degrees and that makes a very effective sort of a mirror for the rf so that's your ground side, and then the tower side is your hot side, or the center pin of your coax, and you feed those two wires, and that's your transmit antenna. Um, so yeah, you're talking about a 130 foot tall tower if you want to put out big signal on this. And that's why you don't hear anybody under the age of 60, because a lot of ham radio is kind of dominated by uh, just basically this, this stereotype that's more true than people want to admit of hey i was a cold war engineer um you know i made like a pressure relief valve for raytheon for the f-14 back in the 70s i've been getting royalties off that for 30 years and i can put uh you know like two hundred thousand dollars into my ham station and i'm not bagging on their like sum of money you know that they spend on it i would love to have a station like that but when you think about the flip side, who under the age of 40 is going to be able to A, afford the land, B, get the permits, C, go through the effort just to be able to talk on ham radio. Um, and yes, the most effective ground plane is infinite size, um, but a quarter wave is kind of the, the floor. Um, you can use eighth wave if you put a whole bunch of them out, but your antenna just starts to work better and better as you get longer and longer and more of a ground field out there. Um, so that's why, you, you know, uh, um, as you work with a more limited space situation, um, you can work the higher bands better than you can work the lower bands. Um, full wave versus half wave versus quarter, it's actually interesting. Depending on the type of antenna that you have, um, a full wave antenna may work less well than a half wave. Um, because there are interesting kind of cancellations um, that happen along the wires. We'll, we'll maybe take a look at a couple of antenna models um, at some point. Actually, you know what? We can take a look at it now. Um, let me switch over views and we'll pull one monitor up and take a look and see. We'll take a look at the difference between a half wave and a full wave antenna. Um, this would be kind of neat. And it'll introduce you uh, all to a little bit of antenna modeling, um, which I do a whole lot of. I've got a bunch of designs set up, and we'll play around with this wonderfully 90s aesthetic program. Um, where is my main monitor? And yes, green pos is the only way to go. Um, I will die on this hill. You'll be banned from this Twitch if you argue otherwise. Not really, of course, but... Um, so let's bring over, this is a program called mmana-gal. Um, it was uh, made by a guy whose initials are mm. 
um, and it is uh, basically a GUI for an interface, uh, um, a GUI interface for a program called um, the NEC modeling uh, software. Um, it's antenna modeling code. Um, normally, there's a text input and output, um, and then uh, th this guy basically strapped a graphical interface on top. So you can more easily create stuff without having to just basically write text files, run the program, and then read the text file outputs. Um, Amber's fine. I actually have an Amber theme on my DMR ham radio. It has customizable colors. So I'm, I'm, I'm not really standing in green boss. Um, but I did spend several years as a teenager with nothing but an IBM XT with an Amber monitor. Um, so I have seen my fill of Amber on black, which is why I picked green now. So um, let's just model up a quick uh, dipole and, and we'll make it a couple of different lengths and we will see how the patterns uh, come out um, at different lengths. Um, so let's play with a 160 meter dipole. Um, we go to 1.9 megahertz is gonna be our design frequency. Um, and then uh, we're gonna need a total of three wires. We're gonna need the two dipole elements and then we're going to need a tiny little bit in the middle, and we're going to feed the antenna from that little bit in the middle. Um, we'll just put it on the y-axis for now. Um, we'll start at one centimeter, and then ballparking, uh, it's 160 meters, so we will make each one a quarter wavelength long. Um, so let's make this wire 40 meters long. Um, we, we, we do everything in metric because otherwise the math is just fucky. Um, we'll make another wire. We'll start it at negative one centimeter and then we'll go out to negative 40 meters so this thing is 266 ish feet long and then we need a wire to connect these two bits um, you see here in the view it's zoomed out but we have two different wires here um, and then we're going to make a little, little tiny one that's two centimeters long going from negative 0.1 on the y-axis to 0.01 on the y-axis and then you need to set a feed point. You need to say, I'm going to be sending energy into this antenna from this certain point on this certain wire. Um, and so the uh, there's a weird kind of terminology for this in this program, but that's going to be W3C, which means the exact center of wire three, which is our little two centimeter long bit that connects the two halves. Um, so we have this. Um, there's different models for height above ground and stuff. We're going to do it in the free space. And then you just do a start. And so looking at the numbers, I know that a dipole in free space is going to be uh, about uh, 72 ohms and no ohms of reactance. Um, reactance is basically, um, it's a imaginary value. We, we do deal with imaginary numbers um, when tuning RF circuits um, that indicate that it's off tune. Um, I can tell right here that this is just a little bit long. Um, so I'm going to go in and this program fortunately has a really nice feature. You control R and you can replace one value with another and it will replace the negative number of that value with another. With another. So we're going to take this down to 39 meters per side. So we made it six and a half feet shorter or whatever. And you can see here that the reactance is a smaller number and we're getting closer to 72 ohms. Um, I'm doing this manually, but this can actually automatically tune your antennas. It does a little sort of evolutionary um, algorithm to test your wire length. You tell it the parameters to wiggle when it finds the best match and so on. Um, let's go to 38 and a half per side. And that's pretty close. You can see it's very close to the 72 ohms that a dipole is. And there's only negative one ohm of reactance. Yes, we have negative ohms in this in this uh, hobby um, and it doesn't make sense until it does um, so don't dwell on the negative reactance too much uh, this is like two inches too short but I'm not gonna mess with it um, so now we can do a model of the actual pattern um, and this is what it looks like our antenna is left to right along the y-axis um, so you have a basically a figure eight pattern um, going from broadsides of the antenna. So if this antenna is up and it's erected east to west, um, you're going to have best performance um, to stations north and south of you. And this is kind of the uh, the classic dipole pattern is a figure eight. And then stations right off the ends, 
nothing ever really gets infinite here. Um, so they'll be like 20 or 30 dB quieter. You, you'll still probably be able to work them. Um, but that's how it looks in free space with no ground plane. If this thing was up 10,000 miles in the sky, this would be the pattern of the antenna. Um, so just to show how it changes when you put it above real ground, and select real ground and let's put this thing um let's say let's put it 20 meters in the air this is one eighth of a wavelength this is kind of a common height for things so that's still 66 feet in the air um over an average ground and we'll say that it's made out of copper wire that just adds a little bit of conventional resistance um so we do a start and you see that that the, the actual feed point impedance drops drastically because um, we're dealing with long wavelengths here. This is only an eighth of a wavelength above the ground. And at those low heights, the ground has a very um, kind of lossy effect on the antenna. That's why you want to get your stuff up as high as possible. Um, but 60 feet in the air is about average. And you can tell it's a little bit off tune. We would need some sort of circuit to match this to a feed line perfectly. Um, but it's still very close to what you might see in a real life situation. Um, so we've tested, we've got our feed points, uh, numbers there, and then we look at the plots, and it looks considerably different now. You can see how it's much less of a figure eight, and you now have coverage off of the sides. Um, but what's interesting, so on the left-hand side, this is your azimuth pattern. So this is if you're directly above the antenna looking down, what um, its performance is around the compass. And then this is your elevation pattern. So looking at it from the side, um, it's going to have best performance actually going straight up. Um, this is not necessarily a bad thing on the shortwave bands. Sometimes you want to bounce your signal straight up um, because you want to talk to a station that's only 200 miles away. And if you have RF going straight up at some frequencies, it's going to nicely bounce back down to them in kind of an acute triangle. Versus if you have it way up high, it's going to send most of the energy out very close to the horizon and you may miss them. Um, so this is not necessarily a bad thing, but this is what antennas look like kind of uh, in a real world situation. It's just kind of a blob. This would work roughly equally well in all directions. Um, these sides here are only about six decibels weaker than off the ends. Um, so this would work perfectly fine for just like Regional coverage, you want to talk to people within 200 to 400 miles or so, this antenna would work quite well. Um, so now let's stretch it out and let's check out um, a longer antenna. Um, and we had a question about a half wave versus a full wave antenna. So this is a half wave antenna here. It's two quarter waves back to back. So we're going to basically double this um, and let's make it uh, um, 0.5. Yes, you can do simple math in the fields. This dude was kind of smart when he wrote this program. Um, and then let's start. And whoa, we have some crazy numbers here. Look at that impedance. 5,200 ohms versus 36. And a whole bunch of reactants compared to 28 ohms. So the general concept is that quarter waves and quarter wave multiples are easier to feed than these half waves. You can still use an antenna that's a half wave long, but you have to have some sort of transformer to take this down by a factor of 100, from about 5,200 ohms down to about 50 or 75. Um, the flip side is that um, these antennas can sometimes perform better, um, but there are special considerations. So now that we've done the math on this, we're going to take a look at the pattern and actually mix that let's go back to the free space so, so we were looking at a clean figure eight with the quarter wave on each side now let's see what it looks like on a half wave on each side and that's what it looks like if it would be out in space and now you can see that the pattern is much sharper you have a lot more gain basically broadside to the antenna and you have much larger dead spots on the sides so this antenna might miss some stations that are like 20 or 30 degrees off axis of the antenna, where the shorter one might actually pick them up better. So having a longer antenna is not always better. Um, 
So that is kind of what a half wave versus a um, quarter wave looks like. Um, and then s since we're time two, this is a full wave. So this is 160 meters long on this band versus 80 meters long. So this thing would be 530 feet of wire with a feed line running up dead center. You need to use big ass wire. You need to have a couple of like 70 foot tall oak trees at the right spot. This would be something that you need 10 acres to put out properly. Um, so again, would be a great antenna if you had this east west and you wanted to talk north and south of you but may cause you problems if you want to talk to people off of the ends of it to the east or west um and then if we go back and we put it back over the real ground and run the test and go back there back those guys off they're just kind of chit chatting they're kind of hard to hard to pick out right now there's a lot of noise um you see that it's got kind of that that same pattern where it shoots a lot of a, like a whole bunch of energy up, you know, like like this is still 60 ish, 70 ish feet off the ground, still sh sh uh, shooting that energy up. But um, you're getting less of that figure eight, more of that just kind of round donut pattern. So this is what it would look like in real life. But with that shorter antenna, we were only about six dB down here. We were right here on the sides. And this thing is like 14 db weaker off of the ends so again this would be an antenna that you might lose some stations off of the ends of the wire that you would not lose if you had the shorter antenna so longer is not always better um and yeah that's that's the whole point of rancho is i want to get some land i want to put some huge antennas up um i actually like telephone poles better than towers towers are super expensive you need to buy like ten thousand dollars of concrete get a truck out there telephone pole is a thousand bucks for a 70 foot pole you put 15 feet of it below ground you have 55 feet to go up and they'll just drop it off off of a flatbed truck and there is a uh, always a constant supply of telephone poles and, th and that's the new price too you, you know you might pay like 50 or 75 per for for like a truck delivery but telephone poles are where it's at and then you can just put the little spikes on and climb that fucker and put your wires up. And the nice thing is they're non-conductive. So if you want to make a vertical antenna, you can just install a telephone pole and just string a wire all the way up. Versus having a tower which has to be grounded and you have to feed it in this particular way, so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, hopefully this Twitch stream will blow up and I'll make a million dollars and we can buy the Rancho and put a bunch of stuff up. Um, and I sense a crude joke coming on from sagebrush <laughs> not quite as dirty as I was hoping but uh, hey that works awesome um, so uh, we've gone over some of the basic dipole antennas um, I'll take uh, just a real quick look and we'll look at, at a vertical like you might see like the whip off of your uh, off of your FM antenna on your truck or something like that um, or like a CB antenna um, so let's just create a new one and then we'll see how things look at various lengths here. Um, now what I'm going to do, because making verticals for 160, oh, pe people only use um, quarter waves because it's not possible to do a half wave or um, what's called a 5 eighths wave um, on 160 because you're literally talking about a 400, 500 foot tower at that point. Not many people have the resources for that. First of all, at, uh, anything above 200 feet above average terrain, you have to get FAA approval and put lights on it. Um, so that's a big barrier. So people generally try to keep it to 199 or lower. And yes, there are hams out there that live on 160 acres of Kansas farmland, and they have exactly 199 foot tall towers. Um, so they don't need the like blessing from the FAA. Um, so let's play around on the 20 meter band. This is eight times higher in frequency. We're at about 14 megahertz versus like 1.2. Um, this is a band that's really good at long distance contacts. This is where you talk around the world, um, but you have like a donut of coverage. You can't talk to people within about 500 miles on this band. So we're gonna make a simple quarter wave vertical here. Um, we're gonna start out at zero and we're gonna use the Z axis for this one. We're gonna just make a one centimeter piece. That's gonna be where we hook the coax up. And then we're gonna make our element here. And a quarter wave at 20 meters is actually gonna be 5.3-ish. 
Um, the bands are nominally named. It's not exactly 20 meters long. Um, it's it's like uh, 21 or something like that. So we're going to add our feed point, which is the center of wire one, the little one centimeter thing there. And we have our element, which is about 17 feet or 5.3 meters tall. And we're going to make sure that this is not above the ground because we're going to use the ground as the other half of the antenna here. You have to have two halves for an antenna. If you just hook a wire up to the center pin of a radio like jack, um, you uh, won't get much signal. You have to have two halves. They have to work against each other. And that's what actually generates the voltage. Um, sort of. I will show the the uh, optimization thing here in a little bit. You don't necessarily need to know all the math, but you need to kind of know what you're doing to run this. But where this shines is that it can tweak the lengths of the elements and um, design the antenna exactly how you want it, which is important when you're talking about multi-element arrays, so on and so forth. So we're going to have this zero meters above the ground. So it's going to see the earth as the other half of the antenna. Just use copper wire for it again. And then we're going to start out. Um, this is pretty close to tuned. It's a little bit long because um, there's positive reactants. I know that. So we'll try 5.2. And we're getting closer. Um, a quarter wave is going to be about half the impedance. Um, I mentioned that it's about 72 ohms um, for a dipole. It's about 37 for a quarter wave. And that's really close there. We're just a little bit tiny long. That's about right. That's that's uh, going to be a very well-tuned antenna. Um, so we take a look at the pattern here, and it's a perfect circle. This is an omnidirectional antenna that receives, at a given angle of the waves coming in, equally well in all directions. And that's why you would want to use a vertical antenna um, if you want to pick up stuff from all 360 of the compass. But if you look at the elevation pattern, this is what an average quarter wave looks like. So at the horizon, if things are coming in perfectly flat, it's pretty deaf. And that actually does go down to like negative infinite. But stuff never comes in at zero degrees. Average, if you're working the short wave bands, you're going to see angles 15 to 30 degrees of the incoming waves. Um, so this has pretty good performance around there. It's still down a little bit. Um, basically, the longer you want to talk, the lower that angle's got to be. You'll hear about low angle radiation and so on, and that's what you want to optimize with these if you want to talk really far on a ham radio. So this would work pretty well. This is what a lot of people use. This is actually the pattern of, uh, for example, Cat5's shortwave vertical. This is the pattern of my 20 meter vertical um, and my 40 meter one, actually. So this is what, what, what we work with a lot. At this low angle here that's only 10 degrees, up it would talk pretty far and it's only two or three db off of max pretty decent um so let's take an example where we don't know how long the antenna's got to be um let's say uh i've got a, a 6.5 meter wire um and then we're going to watch this thing kind of optimize it a little bit and kind of tweak it so what we do here we can tell it has a shitty match it's got a lot of reactants. This would poorly match to a feed line. You'd have a lot of wasted power. Your radio would not be happy and you'd be having problems. You say, okay, what's the best length for this antenna? So keeping in mind that um, wire two is our big element. We don't want to mess with wire one. That's just our little tiny little feed point segment. Now that's a cool thing here. It's optimization. And so here is where the real magic happens in this program. Um, superconductors, yes, and they work very well. So, uh, the slight downside is that you have to keep them um, immersed in liquid helium. Um, it's kind of tricky when you're talking about 17 feet of antenna out in nature. So at the top of the screen, you have the parameters that you're going to look at. This is what you care about when you're optimizing this. Um, you have the gain, um, which is how, how much it kind of boosts your signal. Um, this is the front to back ratio. It doesn't matter with this antenna because it's omni. Um, but if you're designing a directional antenna that only shoots signal in one direction, sometimes you want to make sure 
that more than anything, you don't get signals off of the back. You want to make this thing a laser beam. So you would have a lot of front to back ratio waiting here. Um, but we're going to bring the slider down because we don't care here. What we do care here um, is about the match of the antenna, how well it's tuned to the feed line, which is going to be about 50 ohms or so. And that's defined by these two fields. Um, the JX is this crazy imaginary component here. Um, and then the SWR is the overall match of it. And that's the most important thing here. And the JX is the second most important thing. So we're going to put that about 80. The SWR is weighted at 100. So the program is going to care about the SWR uh, um, uh, parameter a little bit more than this. And those are the only two things that we're going to optimize this for. So it's going to test those numbers. It's going to lengthen or shorten the, 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 um, at the main uh, wire by a little bit and then test again and see if it's better or worse. If it's worse, it goes the other direction. If it's better, it keeps going. And that's just how this nails down the length of stuff. Um, so we want a wire. Um, and we're gonna use wire two. And this means that we're going to adjust the length of the antenna by adjusting the end of it. The end is that second bit that's six and a half meters up in the air currently. Um, association means that you can have more than one entry in this in this chart and they will all move in unison. We're just tweaking one wire so that's not needed. Um, the step is currently set to three centimeter bits. We'll leave that. And then you can set minimum and maximum if you have constraints. If you say this antenna cannot be longer than 12 meters long, you can put in a max of 12 and it will guarantee not go past that. And then 6.49 is the current length of this wire. And then all you do um, is you hit start. Oh, what did I do wrong here? Oh, sorry. Oh, I was wrong. This is your pivot point. This is the, the point that's not changing. So we need to focus on the start point. Actually go back and fix it because it screwed it up a little bit. Um, 0.01. There's a lot of trial and error trying to get things modeled up just right here. All right, so this is connected to the bottom of that. The start point is going to stay the same, and then we're going to wiggle the end. So I was wrong about that. I've used this program so much that actually explaining it is kind of tougher than just running it in my head. So let's start here, and then let's see what it does. Now we're working. That's all the time it took to find the best length for this. Um, you can save the log to find the changes. But here you can see, as it changed the value, it tested the antenna, and these are all the different parameters that it was looking at. Um, we were looking at these first two. Um, so it took it to 6.52 meters, and it looked better, and then 6.46, and it looked even better. So it tried 6.4, and it goes in bigger steps and then kind of drills down to that minimum segment size. Um, and then we ended up um, going too short, it brought it down to 4.6, so it started going back up. Um, 5.29, it was a little bit past our goal. And then it just kind of went back and forth until it centered in on the exact length. And we can go back and see that it made an antenna that was 5.15 meters long. And that is what it optimized this antenna to. Um, you, you can take a look. The plots look pretty much the same as the other one. Um, I just know how long a 20 meter antenna is, so my first attempt was pretty damn close. Um, the pattern doesn't change if you make these antennas one or 2% shorter, really. Um, but uh, that's how you do a basic optimization. Um, we'll go through just a couple other uh, of my models because I, I do a lot of these. Uh, we're not gonna save that because I've made it a thousand times. Um, and you can see that I, I've done a lot of uh, modeling with this. Um, these are all ones that I've created out of my own. Um, and uh, I'll take a look and see at just a couple of them that I've, that I've modeled up. I have actually physically built some of these. Um, for example, this antenna here. Um, this is the antenna that I use for the two meter band. So it's centered around 146 megahertz. Um, and this is called a Yagi antenna. It has eight elements. Um, it is roughly 4.2 meters long. Um, and if you look at it, we'll do a quick model. This is 
it's actually 144.2 ish we'll take a look at the pattern of this and this is what a highly directional antenna looks like um, so you have this big front lobe here um, that's off the end of the antenna and that's where you aim it for the best signal um, and you can see here that there's shitty reception off of the sides and off of the back and that's what you want you want to like poke it on oh, it kind of is isn't it you want to like like aim this thing towards the station you want to listen to and ignore everybody else um, so this is the the um, antenna that I use for what's called a weak signal work um, so very faint signals from far off on the VHF band, I, I point this at one person and I can hear one person very far and everybody else I go deaf to. Um, and then on, on the right side, this is the elevation chart. So it's spitting out a lot of signal at the horizon, virtually nothing off of the back. So that lines up with the, the, the pattern off of the back. So this is what a long directional antenna looks like um, in a model. Um, and I spent a lot of time, I, I did use the um, the um, auto optimization thing on this to kind of tune the lengths and all that um, it's drilled down pretty tightly to the millimeter um, you can set the the, the uh, wire diameter which is very important because the tuning does change with that um, and this is an antenna that I've actually built so I know exactly what the diameter of all the aluminum rods I used were um, and it turned out to work almost exactly to this model so it's very accurate um, and then we'll take a look um, at just a couple of others um, just to give you an idea of what different an um, antennas look like. Um, here is, um, so here's an, a similar antenna. This is for the six meter band. So this is three times lower in frequency. It's about 50 to 52 megahertz or actually 54, but we hang out in the bottom half. This only has three elements. Um, so this is your dipole. This is just a dipole, just like the 160 meter, big, huge wire, but it shrunk down. We use that to feed these antennas. Um, and then this is called a reflector. And it's slightly longer th that, uh, than the dipole. And then you have a director, which is slightly shorter. And those work together to aim the signal. Um, you don't add multiple reflectors to make it higher gain you add a bunch more directors stre stretching out on that x-axis. Um, and we'll do a start, it's on 50.2, and that's supposed to be 26 ohms. This is a weird antenna. And you can see here that this is a little bit less sharp than that big long wire, that, or that um, long Yagi for two meters. So this has broader pattern. I can catch anybody within about the front 90 degrees of this antenna, which is useful because it's larger and it's harder to turn with my rotator. It takes a little bit more grunt. So, you, so I just kind of aim this uh, slightly east or southeast, and I can talk to the whole Mid-South out to you know Florida and the Carolinas. I aim it northeast-ish, say like 60, 70 degrees, and I talk to everybody from like Minnesota through like Virginia and so on. Um, California, you know, down here in the like uh, uh, 240 to 270 range. Um, so I can cover a couple of states with this, which is more important on this band because the signals do bounce on this band. So I can talk to people uh, 200 miles out or 800 miles out or 1500 miles out on this when the conditions are right. Um, so that's what a shorter directional antenna looks like. And you'll notice that it still has really good pattern off the back and sides. I'm going to cut down on any noise, say my neighbor's got a shitty laptop charger or something like that. Um, if I aim this antenna away from that, I'm not going to pick up much of that noise. And sometimes that's more important than aiming the, the um, antenna at what you want to hear, is aiming the back or the side of the antenna towards what you don't want to hear. Um, and that's an important concept that a lot of people don't get at first when they're playing with these directional antennas. Um, sometimes you want to null out a bad signal more than you want to peak a strong one. Oh yes, um, I hear laptop chargers, um, shitty switching power supplies. I can hear them from a quarter mile away. Um, they will they will blast through. Um, let's go back to the shortwave bands for a quick demo on this. Um, we're up on the radio on the top left here, and um, just a quick spin through. Um, that's a switching power supply. That's another one. 
every like 20 or 30 kilohertz. Listen to that dirty signal. It's just horrible noise because they don't care about it. It's it's not even constant frequency. They just have kind of free running oscillators. Um, and and we can go up to the 75 meter band. Sorry for the blast. Um, it's not quite as bad here. I'm actually not getting too much power supply noise on this band, um, but my antenna is kind of deaf on this band, the one that I'm currently switched to. Um, so uh, it is a uh, very much a serious concern. Um, I've gone through my entire house. Um, so the context is that I live in a 100% metal cottage, it has metal siding, metal window screens, even has bars on the windows. Hell yeah, Lakewood, Colorado. Um, so it's a Faraday cage. Radio signals have a really hard time getting in here. So um, the two problems are that um, I it, any strong signal that I want to receive, I have to run a feed line to, and that that is back behind me. Um, all that stuff on the wall there, that's, that's a panel between my window and the frame. All my coax lines come through there. Um, so if I want a signal, I can't just like take an FM radio and turn it on in here. I won't pick up shit. Um, so I have to have a coax line coming in from an antenna outside to get it. Um, and then the flip side is that anything in this house, in this cottage, if it does generate RF noise, it blasts out my radios because they will pick up local noise just off the power lines and stuff like that. So I've spent a lot of time to really clean up um, any bad switching power supplies in this house do not get used. I throw them out and find a better one. Um, because it is such a huge problem when you're trying to pick weak signals up if you've got your asshole neighbor with a bad charger or something like that unless you can aim an antenna away from them they're going to blast out the signal you're trying to pick up um let me see uh we'll just spin through the 40 meter band this is again twice the frequency hand bands a lot of them are harmonically related um for various legacy reasons um That's actually digital signals, that's not noise. So I am getting a little bit of noise on this antenna. It's actually a fairly quiet one, um, but we're gonna switch over to a different one. So this, this um, one that I just switched to is a long horizontal wire. Um, versus the vertical that we were on when we went up the band. And I bet we'll get some different signals here. There you go. That's a switching power supply. And from, so from like 72, 79, all the way to 72, 75. That's, that's four kilohertz of the hand band that is unusable. Nobody's gonna punch through that. I'm not gonna be able to hear shit. I can transmit fine, but I won't be able to hear the other guy. Um, so yeah, 7250 or 7275, there's one. Um, there's another one. And it's just nasty digital hash. It's just a square wave. And what's interesting that's all one bad power supply out there in the neighborhood somewhere because of the way they're built so these switching power supplies have oscillators that run in this case i know it's about 60 kilohertz um why because those noise bands are about 60 kilohertz apart so that bad laptop charger is squirting out a signal on 60 kilohertz 120 kilohertz 180 240 300 360 every 60 kilohertz all the way up to seven megahertz at least. We're at like the 150th or whatever harmonic of that original 60 KC signal and it's still shitting out bands of interference. That is how bad poorly uh, built uh, switching power supplies are. They will destroy the entire shortwave spectrum in 60 kilohertz chunks. 
And that is why I bitch and moan about switching power supplies so much. Because um, if you have three of those things and they're running on slightly different frequencies, say you have one that's you know got like a 45 kilohertz uh, oscillator, one that's 60, and one that's 70, all those harmonics are going to stack up and it's going to render like two thirds of the ham radio spectrum unusable because you can't hear anybody underneath that nasty digital hash. Um, so end rant on why I hate bad switching power supplies. <laughs> Wow, we are at 10. It is about time, friends. Um, yeah, between the five hours of meetings and uh, interviews and trainings that I did today, um, and then three hours of knocking it out here on the Matty Zedcast, um, I am beat. Um, and I think that we did uh, a whole lot of good today. We got that compressor rocking and rolling. I'm going to uh, order a couple of light bulbs to pop back behind those tubes. And then I'm going to see if I can find the bill of materials for that compressor so I can order an exact replacement switch for that. If I can get that, we may go ahead and rip that thing apart one more time, put a new switch in there, and bring that thing back up to 100%. Um, so thanks everybody for hopping on. Um, don't forget, I got to show off my little outro video. But again, because my Streamlabs is kind of fucking up tonight, it may not scroll right. But we'll wrap it up with a couple minutes of that. Thank you all so much for joining us on the Matty Zedcast. Um, the next stream is going to be uh, 3 p.m. Saturday, uh, Mountain Time. That is also 2200 UTC. So if you're not Mountain Time and you can't do the math, time to learn how to convert UTC to your local time. Um, and uh, I look forward to hanging out with you all this weekend. We'll have some uh, more fun stuff to play with. Um, we may go ahead and start the saga of the Yezu 757, get that thing ripped apart and try to bring it back to life and get a vintage 35 year old ham rig back in fighting trim. Um, so again, from me, Matty Zed, thanks everybody for uh, hanging out. Um, remember to follow me. Um, we are now, I believe, going to hit affiliate status. I'm not asking for your money, just for your love and your eyes. Um, so we'll see you in a few days. Thanks again and we'll catch you soon. Peace. Thank you.